I was the four, the last winner of the New Space Business Plan competition. So today I look forward to padding off the torch to the next winner, uh, the next round. Uh, also today, as we kick off our event, I want to thank the Thunderbird School of Management's Executive Master of Global Management in Space Leadership, Business, and Policy for their generous sponsorship of one of our lectures today. If you'd like to become a sponsor, simply add a sponsorship to your registration for our next event. Yesterday's conversations covered a lot of ground, and we're glad you're back for another day of programming. Later on, we'll have a special Saturday space segment, and Leo has put a link in the chat to the music video we'll be talking about, so you can watch it anytime between now and then. I think Leo has already placed that. If not, I think that's forthcoming here in a second. Otherwise, since we're jumping right in, uh, our first conversation today will be, between, will be between Tim Crispin and John Weathersby. I'd like to introduce both of them here. I think you're pretty familiar with Tim, but for those who are just joining, I'll, I'll give his intro again. Tim is the executive director and co-founder of Foundation for the Future. A former CIA and Army intelligence officer, Tim supported the National Space Council and the joint staff of the Pentagon. He holds master's degrees in intelligence studies and international relations and affairs, both from American University. Mr. Christman is the author of the book, Humanity in Space, and in various articles about the expanse of our civilization in space. Tim's next mission and challenge is to make space accessible, survivable, and ultimately routine enough to be boring. John Weatherby has decades of experience building teams of experts who solve complex problems through innovative thinking and successful collaboration. Over the past 20 plus years, he's founded and managed multiple organizations leading to the development and commercialization of technologies in the field of open, space, open source software, cybersecurity, unmanned vehicle systems, and nanotechnology and healthcare. He has succeeded in securing over $20 million in commercial and federal program funding, and has been recognized as one of the top open source influencers in the US government. He is currently focused on the commercial space industry, developing a diverse network of supply chain vendors and improving their business opportunities. Tim and John, thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome. Thanks, Brett. Great to have you here. Uh, yeah, and excited to see uh, who tries to unseat you as reigning champion. <laughs> it's, uh, it's unfortunate we don't have these sort of head-to-head -head contests where we can do those sweet little boxing fight um, posters uh, for the different uh, leaders of, of the businesses. But uh, yeah, no, excited to be here this morning with John. Uh, John and I have been... Um, talking on and off now for the better part of a year. He's uh, one of the, the people who early on with the foundation uh, found us and uh, has been a fantastic source of advice uh, and insight uh, as we've gone along and grown. And I'm excited that uh, with, with this event sort of uh, highlighting our one year birthday that we're able to bring in uh, someone like John uh, to open up the day and and talk about uh, Stellar Modal Transportation Association, uh, the uh, new organization that uh, John is in the middle of standing up. And uh, yeah, before I jump into any more questions, John, I want to just uh, give you the floor for a second to uh, see if you have any more you want to add to your intro. First, can you hear me? Okay, comms check. Um, welcome to the Bat Cave. Um, living, working at home. My wife asked if I can put any more computers in my little office. I've obviously run out of desk space. Um, no, I'd just like to start off by saying thank you for letting us have opportunity to speak and congratulate uh, you and the entire staff on the phenomenal job you guys have done. Um, this is you and I are doing the same thing. And uh, tell her, right, this isn't easy. You wake up and make it up every day. So um, the, the level of just tenacity and consistency and quality in things that you guys are bringing to the table are, are incredible. And I'm, um, we're, we're thrilled and honored to be, uh, to help in any way possible. Yeah. No, thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I mean, we're seeing, you know, events like today really, uh, they may have been started 
uh, by uh, me, and I mean, sure, you see this m- with what you're doing, but uh, you may spark something, but then somebody like Lee Steinke comes in, takes over, and makes it uh, epic and amazing. And so, um, I don't want to talk any more about Stellar Modal. Uh, I want to know what it is. Tell, tell us more about it. You, you and I have talked a little bit about it, but uh, let's let's jump right in. All right. So, Stellar Modal is uh, the Stellar Model Transportation Association is uh, it's a trade association. It's a 501c6, uh, it's international, um, and it's, its purpose is to uh, do what trade associations are supposed to do, and that is how to help facilitate business opportunities. The old adage that a rising tide lifts all ships that's what an association is supposed to do. It's different than what you're doing. You're a research-based group and you're attacking the one set of problems and we're looking at another. And that's one of the things that's so important to us in our relationship with y'all and, and everybody else that's on, this, uh, on this, this event and throughout this industry is that there's, there are enough challenges and there's no binary way strategically to solve them so when everybody goes at it and works collaboratively, then we can get there. And uh, you and I have built a, a, a good collaborative relationship. We're looking at other organizations because, you know, when you get provincial, you get focused on just me and mine and you forget that a team is not made up of quarterbacks. You know, you've got to have the pulling guards. You've got to have the receivers. You've got to have all that. And when we can build uh, a network throughout the industry of folks that know each other and work with each other and hopefully like each other, then it's going to make this whole process a lot better and a lot more uh, beneficial and profitable and likely successful for everyone. So um, we're a trade group. Um, we started uh, we started looking around when when we kind of got in this space. And, and, and we were looking for a gap that wasn't filled. And um, the, uh, the term stellar modal uh, came up, it's a creative term. Uh, as Bio said, I've been a defense contractor for 20 something years. So one of my DOD clients, we were trying to, um, we're working with the port of Gulfport, Mississippi, working with uh, Transcom mm-hmm. and uh, trying to get, uh, trying to get Port of Gulfport designated as a strategic seaport. And that's where I got a deep dive into intermodal transportation. Intermodal transportation is simply shipping cargo using multiple modes of transportation. So what in that process, I learned about how diverse it is and the supply chain and the logistics are what keeps it going. What did Napoleon say? You know, an army marches on its stomach. Yeah. So, so yeah, we're doing exploration, then we'll do colonization, then we'll do commercialization, but it's the, the, it's, it's the grease in the gears. Yep. It's all the people that you don't see that's going to make this thing successful because for every one rocket, there are 10,000 people that worked on it in some capacity and not everybody's a rocket scientist. So, you know, you, you've got to look out and say, okay, where are these different pieces, where they fit in, how do they work together? So that's what we're looking at. Um, In a lot of, in a lot of ways, it's a real low tech, but it is a, we say that we're, we're about the business of space commerce. Mm, Yeah. You know, at some point it's got to go from, uh, public sector government funding to, okay, how's this making money? And that, when we get there, that's when it'll become an industry and oh, yeah. not just, not just a, you know, government-based effort. Yeah. So. No. And I think what you're talking about, like with, you know, the 10,000 components, each with their own unique manufacturing style and uh, needs, Um, being distinct from that rocket scientist who came up with the design for the rocket is uh, really on theme for this month where we're talking about how do you look at workforce development for space? Because 
every kid in school, when they get first talked about space to they're they're thinking astronaut floating around, I've got to, you know, be a fighter pilot, or I've got to be the smartest person in my state so I can design the next generation, insert cool tech here. But in many cases, it is that supply chain that is enabling those one and two off exceptional people to do everything else. Um, And they are, you know, without that, there's nothing that happens. I mean, I've spent a decade in the army, most of it was special operations. And the vast majority of what we did was making sure all of the stuff that people think is boring is ready to go. Um, and that's an awful lot of bag packing and uh, cleaning stuff and working with a thousand different uh, suppliers to have everything ready. That's exactly what space needs. So that's exciting that uh, you know Stellar Modal Transportation Association is is looking at that. Um, yeah. And you mentioned so you mentioned your trade association, um, and from your description of Stellar Modal, it sounds like it's logistics focused. Um, but uh, what else is there to the focus that I'm not getting? And uh, like, what are the objectives? All right. So everything. Um... Everything that we do, we try to look and say, okay, instead of just going out and being, um, yeah, we just don't want to, we don't want to just have uh, group chats. Yeah, yeah. There there are people that do that. So what we try to do is we try to, we try to identify um, the horizon. Mm -hmm. Where is, where are we going? Where are we going in this market segment? And then back that down to the 10 meter target to say, okay, what are the few steps that we need to take right now? What are the challenges? What are the gaps? Mm. And, and really we try to look at, okay, what are the, what are the non-sexy gaps? You know, yeah. what, you know, like, um, okay. Yesterday I, I was fascinated, fascinated, but you know, when Dallas and his group were doing the yeah. talk and I'm thinking, okay, my, bl- my brain's bleeding here, trying to figure out how these guys brains work and they're on literally another planet. And then it's like, okay, that's great. But how do we get, how do we get the systems? How do we build the launch pad? How do we, you know, how do we get it up there? And then it all goes back to transportation, at least at this stage, you know, in my simplistic view, you're looking at, at the industry from a realistic perspective, you're looking at transportation elements or life support. Mm, yeah. You know, we haven't gotten to the point yet. Yeah, you've got some satellite business, whatever, but we haven't gotten to the mining part. We haven't gotten to the colonization part. You know, the ex- you know, it's science right now. It's theoretical. Yeah. Okay, that's great. We're going to have to focus on getting there and, and helping to realize the dream that these brilliant people are putting out there. And then from a logistics perspective, I start thinking of all the things that can go wrong because, you know, space is not your friend. You know, (laughs) I mean, you've been parts of the world where everything there is trying to kill you. Space is the epitome of death itself. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's uh, it sounds very much like uh, Oregon Trail. You're uh, you're trying to I I was thinking about that, but you know what? It's even before that. It's like the 1500s when people were in Europe Mm -hmm. and then they were going to a place that that, that was over the horizon they couldn't even see. Mm, But the difference is, and I apologize for getting philosophical, (laughs) but the difference is, is that when they got here, they could still breathe the air. It was full of resource. You know, they had water and everything else. When we go outside the, you know, our atmosphere, we're not designed to go there. So we've got to take everything with us. Mm, yeah. And and like uh, like all these smart people are saying, okay, water, we take water for granted here. You know, not only do we need to find it, but what else can we do with it to turn it into fuel and, you know, reuse yeah. it and yada, yada, yada. Oh, good grief. So um, I'm glad they're dealing with that. Uh, we're going to focus on the simple things like um, how we can find more people like y'all to work with, to reach out and say, you know, you know, y'all need to support Foundation for the Future because 
Tim and his team are, are trying to build and maintain momentum on Capitol Hill. Dude, I don't want that job. Good on you. That's a heavy lift, but somebody's got to do it. Okay. That's y'all's. We're over, you know, working with the small businesses and trying to help the, the companies that are building rockets that are doing stuff, the, you know, the mid tier, lower tier guys. Yeah. How can they find workers? How can they find non STEM workers? That was a great yeah. point that uh, Eric with Scout brought up yesterday. You know, you, you need non STEM people. You've got to <laughs> diversify. You've got to look. You've got to, okay, well, how do you recruit these people? Okay. So we need to be able to reach out to the technical schools, to the community colleges, and tell them that you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do this. We need welders. We need pipe fitters. We need electricians. We need administrative people. We just need smart people with innovation and with yeah. drive. And then, okay, then you've got a highly skilled workforce. How do you keep them? You know, okay, right now, everybody's going to pay top dollar because it's a new thing. But if I'm an environment, if I'm a company and I've got, you know, a hundred, if I've got 10 highly skilled people, um, you know, eventually you're going to be able to pay the same. So what can I do as an employer to, to keep those guys? Right. So one of our other um, elements that we're involved in is, is, is healthcare and how they companies are addressing healthcare needs for their workforce. Okay. Mm. We're connecting the dots. Yeah. yeah. So Sorry, you got me excited. This no, week. no, this is this is uh, this is exciting. Um, and I mean, uh, you know, it was talked about yesterday, and what you're just talking about with the non-STEM workforce. This is exactly what um, it was so cool to see how excited uh, uh, Representative McCollum got earlier this year uh, talking about this because uh, so she's the chairwoman of the Defense Appropriations Committee, and uh, we were talking with her and her staff about this giant gap we say stem steam great it's important we need it yes who you know what about the career and technical education fields below not below um you know that are at the community college level that um what about them where do they get the support from government programs from industry from just publicity uh, and so, you know, seeing her get so excited and then insert language into the defense appropriations bill for this year, mandating that the Defense Department create a pathway for those uh, career and technical education fields, uh, including space, um, is awesome because, you know, working with you uh, and then others in government is exactly what's going to happen next year when DOD has got to come out to us and start working to figure out this plan. Um, and, and Tim, so much of it, money doesn't solve all the problems. So much of it is leadership. Yeah. Just helping people understand that there is a pathway. Yeah. You want to be in this space? Okay, then do it. You know, oh, yeah. here's how you can apply it. And also being able to open up connections and share. That's another thing I really enjoyed about working with you guys is that we share resources. Mm -hmm. You know, what can we do to help? put your message in front of the people we're talking about and vice versa. Yeah. Um, like we were talking, you know, can we say that you and I are talking about doing maybe some cybersecurity events down the road? Right. Right. Yeah. You know, other things. Okay. Cyber people look at cyber, like it's just a terrestrial thing. Okay. Well, right now we're working with folks that are small companies that are getting hit by ransom. <laughs> Okay, what if you're what if you're a company that's got millions and millions of dollars invested in a, a, a space based project and somebody comes in and and locks down your data, you're dead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yesterday, um, someone was talking about their uh, maybe the scout guy again talking about how their um, they kind of got spun up because they sent up a satellite and it just you know it it disappeared. Nobody knows where it is. Well, okay, that is a highly vulnerable yeah. situation. And that's something that you got to plan for now. Mm -hmm. The solutions are there. It doesn't necessarily take something new to do it, but you've got to know where the resources in are and how to apply them. And that's, again, that's, we watched these type of events and we thought, oh, that's a good point. Let us go see who we can find over here that can solve that problem or at least provide uh, a potential solution. 
and then let the market go where it will. Yeah, yeah, no, and uh, uh, we've we've been talking with Amazon Web Services now for a while about trying to figure out how to do just that sort of talking about that, providing educational services. They're really excited to get into um, providing uh, cybersecurity and uh, cyber training for uh, satellite op op uh, operators because of you know they're they're also looking to operate satellites uh, sure. so um so yeah um i think the event we're we're talking about building is is going to be uh, pretty exciting maybe that'll fit into a conversations uh theme for the month maybe we just do a standalone um uh event uh yeah we'll have to it's gonna it's gonna be fun um but i mean we've been talking we've been talking a lot here uh and I know we've, we've only got a couple minutes before Tom uh, comes in with the business plan competition, but uh, um, who all's involved uh, with Stellar Modal right now? Um, I told you that when we when we looked at getting in this space, we said, okay, what what problem sets? Yeah, and then um, I, I've done this a couple of times. I built a trade association back in the early two thousands focus on the adoption of open source within US federal government. And then we did technology transfer stuff coming back from global war on terrorism. So we kind of have seen this process a couple of times. So we, we reached back and, and pulled in uh, several of the people that we had worked with then. And, um, and we said, okay, what lessons did we learn? You know, go pull out the after action report. What lessons did we learn and how can they apply now? Yeah. So we have someplace hard to start. So we've got like a, uh, one lady named Linda Curtin. Linda was the CIO of big NASA, you know, and she's yeah, yeah. just a wealth of information. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, we have her on board. We've got, uh, like I said, cybersecurity experts. One of my buddies was a uh, counter Intel guy for the FBI. He's a big cyber dude. So he looks at it from, from that perspective. We've got DOD program specialists. We've got exotic materials. A lot of the uh, uh, graphene and 2D guys, scientists and uh, researchers. Uh, we've got international business folks. Uh, we've got a lawyer. We've got a cat herder, which is me. So, you know, it's, it's, we put the team together to address the initial um, group. And now we're going out and we're engaging with, um, with different, like with uh, DOD elements, what are some problems that you have that nobody wants to touch? Okay, mm -hmm. let us go find people that can do that. And that's where we're building our membership and support from is uh, we're trying to make it transactional. So, you know, yeah, we, we, we need your support, but what we really want is your participation. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so if, uh, I wanna uh, give a minute here. Uh, if you have anything else, Brett, Fred is uh, ready to ask a question, it looks like, so. I, I wish, I'm loving this conversation, but I, I do know I'm trying to keep track of time for us. I know it's, okay. almost, it's coming up here right on the hour. So let me, uh, and you're good. Tim, you had that last question, otherwise, yeah, we'll. Okay, then uh, Tim and John, thank you so much. Again, I hate to cut this off because they're just getting to the part where I was like sitting on the edge of my seat. What are the problems that nobody else wants to touch? I want to hear more about that. So that's, uh, maybe, maybe we can have some follow-up questions or something later. Um, hey, thank y'all. Appreciate it. And keep doing good work. Y'all are making a big difference and it's very much appreciated. Thanks, John. Thanks very much, John. Uh, Tim and John, thank you so much for the great discussion. Uh, next up, we've got Tom Olson and the New Space Business Plan Competition. Uh, so Thomas Andrew Olson has been the program director for the New Space Business Plan Competition since 2011. And uh, I see you're here on the camera now, Tom. This all yep. will uh, say welcome. Good to see you again. Good to have you here. <laughs> uh, so I just want to just describe the business plan competition. I'm a personal beneficiary of it. Helped spark uh, start my company. I'm a huge, huge fan uh, and a huge uh, uh, supporter of this whole endeavor. So, I'm, uh, Thomas, I'm really glad. I'm really glad to see you here again. Over the last decade, the business plan competition has awarded over three hundred fifty thousand dollars to deserving space race space related early stage companies. Uh, and and Tom is, Thomas is a founder of the Center for Space Commerce and Finance, which sponsors the business plan competition. For over three decades, Mr. Olson has been a business systems engineer and analyst in the communications, aerospace, and publishing sectors. 
In addition, he spent several years in the finance services sector around cash and fund management, and he served on the original organizing committee, the Space Investment Summit, which are events that brought together interested investors and space entrepreneurs for knowledge sharing and professional networking. From 2006 to 2010, he was a regular contributor to the Space Cynics blog, fighting against the ignorance, obfuscation, and boosterism that often pervades the new space sector. Today, he serves as director of business development for Avialto Limited, an early stage firm that will soon provide high altitude platforms distributing internet and mobile services to underserved areas around the world. He's also chair and founder of the not-for-profit Center for Space Commerce and Finance, the new owner of the New Space Business Fund Competition. He's also an all-around awesome guy. Thomas, welcome. <laughs> Good to have you here today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks so much for, for, the, for that great introduction. Uh, it's always a joy to see Brad. He's, I, he's like this, this, per, this perpetual grin on his face. It's like he's just completely happy with his existence and, and, and life is going really well for him. And uh, I, I just want to ask you really quickly, how are things going with you? Because since you won the last time, uh, how did that help you at all, if it did? I, going great. Um, actually, this past weekend, uh, my uh, my co other co-founder and I went up to Michigan and bought some equipment to, to finish setting up our pilot facility. So we're moving forward. We put in our application for the uh, for the deep space food competition. So we're, we're moving forward with that. And we're hoping to be in revenue by January 1st. That's our target. Awesome. So that's, that's great. Cool. That is absolutely great. Uh, I'm glad we could help in our small way to... Uh, Get, get you get you go, get you kickstarted in that that great direction. Um, Thank you very much. You bet. Okay, a um, couple of things. Are, they're always we never do these things, you know, glitch free. Unfortunately, um, as, as of right now, I got I got I got two issues I need to just just tell you about really really quickly. Uh, one of our judges, Dave Heineck, is having trouble getting in to the Zoom call. So Layla or or Lee, if you can uh, if you can find a way to help him that would get in here, that would be really, really great um, since he's kind of involved right now. Um, also, I wanna say that we, uh, while we have four really, really great teams that are gonna be presenting this morning, we did have a fifth scheduled, but I got word from that fifth team, which is Space Enterprises out of Perth, Australia, that um, that there's a, been, I, I knew this you know, since the weekend, there's been some serious illness ravaging his household. And uh, apparently as of this morning, he's, he's gotten it himself, whatever it is, I hope it's not COVID, but uh, in, any, in any event, uh, they won't be presenting today. So we have, we have four really, really great teams I'm gonna to introduce to you here in a minute. Um, but first, uh, before we start, I always try to start to say thank you. I say thank you to uh, Foundation for the Future for sponsoring this great event and the $5,000 grand prize for the winner of the competition today. Um, I also wanna, wanna thank our, all our great coaches uh, for, for all their assistance the last couple of weeks in working with all the finalists and in polishing their pitches and improving their chances. Um, they all did a great job. Jason Held, Kevin Russell, Jeff Kruken, Michael Lane, and Robert Jacobson. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, I want to very quickly, I, and again, I hope uh, we, we see David really soon. I want to introduce our judges uh, who are with us today for this event. Uh, Eva Jane Lark, we'll start with her. Uh, she is a she's a vice president and a wealth advisor with uh, BMO Nesbitt Burns, which is one of Canada's largest full service and investment firms. And she's provided expert advice for over 25 years to her clients. Um, but she's always had a childhood passion for seeing humanity live and thrive beyond the earth. Hi, Eva. Lovely seeing you again. It's always a pleasure to work with you. Um, she's been, obviously, she's been, a, she's been both, she's been a coach, a presenter, an invited judge for the New Space Business Plan Competition for many years now. And I'm really so happy she was able to join us today. Um, Dave Heineck, who we're trying to get in here now, he's having a, he's having a problem. Well, there he is. Yay. Hello. Hi, David. How are you? Um, Hi, Tom. I use Zoom every day, but uh, don't uh, yeah, figure. Yeah, it happens to everybody, but you're here just in time. Yeah. Good for you. Thanks. Um, uh, Dave Heineck is actually a serial entrepreneur, a business thought leader, and a NetSuite subject matter expert. He's the founder and president of Business Fitness, a NetSuite success agency based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 
and for two decades, they have been helping high growth firms. And their services range from implementing NetSuite for the first time or assisting companies in getting the most out of that software. Now, I've known Dave going on oh, about two years now. We met at a Space Investment Summit in uh, Seattle in uh, 2019. And uh, I, I know he has the space bug and, he's, uh, and we, he and I have worked together multiple times over the past two years as coaches for our events. And I thought it was time to turn the wheel and give, uh, give Dave a shot at, at being a judge this time around. So uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing your insights, Dave, on the teams you're about to see today. And finally, uh, my, my good friend for many, many years, he's also been a great coach and a, and a, um, and a judge in the past, uh, Amaresh Kalapara. Um, and he's been advising and assisting a new generation of space entrepreneurs since 2006, um, navigating the world of venture finance, um, and he also thinks that the next five to 10 years of space industry growth will dwarf the past 60 years history of the space economy. And I'm sure we're going to have a lot more conversations about that. Uh, he and I, and maybe all the rest of us as uh, time goes on here over the next few years. Um, but uh, here's something I didn't know about him before, or I just did pick it up. He is an Emmy nominated VR producer. And it's, as well as a space industry executive. He led a project at uh, Facebook's VR company, Oculus, called Mission ISS, which is conducted in collaboration with NASA and is a true to life virtual reality simulation of the International Space Station. Before that, he was a founder and managing partner of Earth to Orbit LLC, uh, a satellite industry advisory firm that helped uh, spearhead the launch of commercial satellites out of India. Today, he's a strategic consultant and he's the chief revenue officer of Off World. Uh, Amaresh, welcome. And your mic's off, but that's okay. We'll uh, just want to give you a chance to say hello briefly. Hello, I'm waving at you, Amaresh. I see you. Okay. Here's the screen. <laughs> Uh, you're kind of glitching in and out, but I'm sure things will things will clean up. Um, here's what here's what we us, what we usually do. Um, now I'm going to break from the from one standard protocol we generally do most most of the time when we've done these things over the years. And just as an aside, this is actually the 20th BPC event that we have done uh, in the last 11 years. But I'm going to break with protocol just a little bit for this one because. We are so far reaching, it's all in virtual world and it crosses you know, multitudes of time zones. Normally, I would have everybody have the finalists just present in alphabetical order by the name of their company. Uh, today, I've decided to do things a little bit differently because uh, we have people away from people the farthest away to the people closest to us. So we're gonna begin our competition today with Esper Satellite Imaging. Shoy Bigbal is with us today. And uh, in just a second, I'll have him share his screen and he can do his pitch. Um, second here, I want, to do that. I want to be able to see it. There we go. Okay. Um, now the rules are gonna be this. Uh, you'll be on a timer. Uh, every t every presenting team gets a chance to uh, pres to do their pitch deck for ten minutes. More than ten minutes, I cut you off, and then the uh, and then the judges in turn get a chance to question you as they will for another nine minutes, and then we go to the next team and may the best team win. And good luck to all of you. And uh, so Schwab, if you can uh, share your screen and put up your uh, your, your deck, and you got your microphone on. Definitely, thanks a lot, Thomas. Just uh, can, making sure everyone can hear and see uh, and hear me and great. see my screen. I would say I would normally say good morning to everyone, but I have to say a double good morning to you because it's actually Thursday morning for you. <laughs> so thank you for staying up so late to uh, to make this happen. It's uh, it's it's going to be great. Okay, so uh, I can see your slides. I presume everyone else can. Um, I will start the timer when you start talking. Awesome. Thanks a lot, everyone. Um, today, we are presenting as Esper Satellites. We're a startup that's delivering intelligent data from space 
for industrial efficiency on Earth. Uh, the reason why we're tackling this specific problem of industrial efficiency is that we've noticed that in a lot of resource-dependent industries, such as agriculture and mining, they're losing productivity year over year. In mining, we've noticed around 25% year over year re uh, reduction in productivity and around 44% in agriculture in terms of how much harvested crops are lost. Uh, we've recognized by working closely with these uh, industries that a lot of these problems are caused due to lack of actionable data available to them. While they do have IoT sensors on the ground telling them the movements of their trucks uh, for in, in mining applications all the way to having ground controls, uh, ground sensors uh, for agriculture, that data still does still falls short in terms of what they actually need to make da their day to day changes. So what we've come up with to help uh, solve this problem is a data stream of our own, a data stream that can help map every single uh, every single part of the field that we're imaging uh, and basically tell us the material makeup of these, uh, of these pieces of land. This has manifested itself as a network of satellites capturing hyperspectral imagery of the earth. Now, hyperspectral imagery is a technique where we capture light in hundreds of different wavelengths, and we use this data to derive the material compositions of the things that we're looking at. Now, in agriculture, we can look at the material compositions of the soil, and this can give us an indication of soil fertility. And in mining, we can look at the composition of the surface of a mine, and this can tell us about the traces of minerals and where exactly they are present, helping us all the way from exploration to uh, the uh, actual operational efficiency of the mine itself. Uh, and this also spans into other applications in oil and gas and maritime where we can track either gas leakages or we can uh, track oil spills on the surface of the ocean. Now, if you dive deeper, uh, dive deeper into some of these applications, agriculture specifically, uh, we can use this data to accurately map out fertilizer requirements because now we know exactly where, uh, what the material composition of the soil is with this data. We can create a heat map of sorts where we can essentially map out what part of uh, the land is missing, what type of fertilizer. This uh, can give us a lot of important metrics along with helping us monitoring the plant health. And these all important metrics altogether can help us predict yield of the overall uh, crop land that we're imaging. We've estimated that this can save around 40% uh, uh, of cost in terms of how much manpower and how much material is to be deployed on the crop itself. Since 2019, we have around $78 million worth of commitments from data analytics companies who want to use our imagery data for their own customers. We have around six letters of support and seven partnerships with similar businesses. We currently have a, a paying contract with a mining firm where we're going to be imaging their land uh, as an aerial test of our imaging technology before we send it up into space uh, to be, to map out the concentrations of different minerals on their land. And we've also raised around $132,000 from a smaller pre-seed round uh, earlier this year. Now, speaking of data analytics companies, we are directly selling to them uh, through one of our revenue channels where we have a pay per square kilometer model. Essentially, one of our images, all of our images have a reference point on the earth in terms of the area that we're imaging. And per that area, we put a dollar value on top of that. And that is how we sell portions of our images to the users who want them. Now, we have two data streams. One that I've mentioned is direct to user, where we have analytics businesses and governments. And the other one is direct to resellers, who then resell our imagery data to uh, back to these analytics businesses and the government as well. The reason why we're doing that is essentially to diversify our reach in terms of how much revenue we can be generating from the data we're capturing. Now, the data that we capture is sent down uh, to our server back on Earth. That's where it's processed. And then that's where we actually start selling our data. In terms of the actual paper square kilometer model, the industry standard has all been to have a minimum water quantity on top of it. But what we're doing is we're trying to keep a tier based pricing model to have a lot of, uh, to have smaller stakeholders have easier, to help them have easier access to this data. 
Uh, we start with around $15 per square kilometer for an order size that is uh, less than 100 square kilometers. We've seen that this works really well for much smaller farms and much smaller mining areas. Uh, all, and we then go up to a smaller price point per square kilometer for orders that are larger than 50 square kilometers. Uh, this is for stakeholders who are imaging millions of square kilometers every week, and then and they want some competitive pricing to be, to stay uh, to have them run their day-to-day -day operations efficiently. These are some of the customers that we're working with. Uh, Kawaspace is an agricultural customer who delivers agricultural insights to uh, farms across India and Southeast Asia. Actuary is an uh, Australian company that delivers financial risk insights to uh, commod agriculture commodity holders. Uh, Tatia Earth is using our uh, using imagery data, wants to use our imagery data to, to, to map ports and map uh, metal manufacturing sites to basically deliver indices on metal production all across the world. And Orbital EOS is one of our analytics partners we're working with in the maritime and defense sector. Looking at our unit economics, one of our satellites, along with the imaging technology that we're building, will cost around $2 million to build and deploy. The operational cost of it per year is going to be around $200,000. But in the first year of the satellite's operation, we estimate it to uh, make around $3.3 million worth of revenue. We estimate to have around 18 satellites by 2025. We, uh, th this will give us around daily coverage of the entire Earth. And per satellite, we aim to have an eight-year lifetime. Looking at the agriculture and forestry markets, sorry, beachhead markets, our TAM is around $4.12 billion and our SAM is around $366 million, only looking at those uh, markets within Australia. We estimate this to double uh, by 2024. And the reason why hyperspectral sensors have not been deployed it, the, way we, uh, the way, way we're trying to build this mega constellation of them is mainly because of the size of these sensors. These sensors use, uh, are still fairly bulky because we need a large aperture to capture a lot of light uh, because we're capturing uh, multiple wavelengths from the data that we're collecting. Now, Previously, the launch has always been the highest cost for this, but now because the sensors are getting smaller, but also, but also with that, the launches are also getting much cheaper. That's allowing us to actually build these sensors uh, at a much lower cost and deploy them at a much higher volume. While there are other companies that are working, uh, that are trying to build hyperspectral constellations, Pixel and Satellogic being uh, some of the uh, leading ones. Pixel is a Bangalore-based uh, company that is going to be launching this, uh, their first satellite in, within the next year. And Satellogic has already launched some of their uh, multispectral satellites uh, that do have some hyperspectral capability. Uh, the reason why we stand out from them is because we're aiming for a much larger spectral range. We talk to our customers and we realize that having that uh, the spectral range that we're going for, which is deeper into the short wave infrared spectrum, gives them more insights in the lands that they're imaging, especially in the agriculture and mining sector, which are uh, the main sectors that we're going after, including forestry. So looking at our product roadmap, next week, we're doing a TRL5 demonstration test of Espresso. That's the imager that you see Im uh, pictured there. Uh, that is going to be flying in mid next year on uh, two of them, uh, two of Espresso's are going to be flying on hosted payload platforms mid next year by June, 2022. And they're going to be space qualified by the end of the, end of the year. But in January, 2023 onwards, we're launching something called Esperoco. That is the IP that we're generating, which is the sensor and the image optical setup along with that, that allows us to capture that larger spectral range. And behind all of that is us. I'm Shoaib, I'm the CEO. I've built and flown high-powered rocket payloads. I've worked as a payload engineer across two high-powered rocket teams and am a three-time startup founder. Joey, our CTO, is a mechanical engineer who's previously co-founded a medtech startup. He's also a three-time hackathon winner. And Manji, our VP of engineering, is an electrical and computer systems engineer who has a research background in, in autonomous systems and uh, machine learning with drones. And currently, we're uh, getting ready to raise a $7 million seed round to launch our Esperoco imaging payload by 2023. This will be the first installment of our imagery uh, of our imagery infrastructure and help us deliver uh, to the $78 million worth of commitments that we currently have. And I'd love to uh, connect with and I'd love to uh, tap your networks to help us uh, accomplish this milestone. And that's been us. And thanks a lot for that. 
Okay, Shway, thanks so much. You just you got in under the line there, just just, and you you did really really well. Thanks. Um, okay, now we're going to start in. Um, if you might want to leave your slides up, just to uh, in case the judges have certain questions, and I want to start uh, right away. Eva Jane, how, what are your comments? Sorry, always the unmuting process, right? Um, okay, uh, so um, uh, I guess I, I get, I'm, I know of more hypospectral satellite companies than you have put in your competitions. So one thing is, is I think there's actually more competition, but I wonder about how localized these markets are. So you said that you're focusing on Australia. I'm in Canada. So the companies that I know are more focused on Canada. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this in terms of, are there local um, areas that you can focus on as opposed to the whole world as a market? Um, we've right. definitely, yeah, we have definitely seen an uptick in a lot of the demand locally here in Australia for the type of imagery, uh, for this type of imagery. And uh, what there are, speaking to our customers specifically here in Australia, there is much to be desired from uh, what is being captured globally, um, which is essentially why we are sort of a, uh, local solution to some of the problems that we are, uh, that they're having here specifically. So in terms of the orbits that we choose, in terms of the uh, techno technology that we put up for the problem sets that we have here, we can specifically tailor that to a lot of our customers that are in, within Australia. Um, most of our, our majority of our customers at the moment, while in some of some are in Australia, are spread across Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia as well. Um, so for us, it does become a, so a challenge in terms of how we should be designing our uh, system or to serve those uh, serve our initial customers first, and then we can start expanding globally. Um, so we have noticed uh, this be a high, uh, be a local problem in terms of uh, what type of sa uh, satellites are currently up there and what orbits they're ser uh, serving, and consequently what geographical areas that they are serving. And um, you know, for us, as mentioned, you know, uh, our uh, customer base is in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Australia. Uh, we are trying to build, uh, serve them for us in terms of the orbits that we are choosing for our first launches. It, uh, and so the orbital, the orbits that your satellites are going to be in are focused on the Southern Hemisphere at the moment. Is that fair to say? Uh, that's correct. Okay, thanks. David, what do you have? Yeah, uh, I too have to unmute. Uh, I'm interested in hearing about, uh, uh, you have a, a potentially huge number of customers, potential. I'd like to hear more on how you plan to get them uh, and how do, you, how do you market yourself? How do you address, uh, uh, how do you get to your customers? Yeah. So most of the customers that we're aiming for are the data analytics companies themselves. So these are the companies that know what type of data that we want to be offering and how they can actually utilize this data. Um, so through those analytics businesses, then we're reaching out to all of these larger industry verticals that I've spoken about. Um, you know, whether it be oil and gas, uh, agriculture, and uh, mining, all of these smaller stakeholders from all the way from finer, uh, farmers to miners to uh, all refineries and the companies that are managing them. So we're using these analytics businesses as a conduit between our imagery data and the intelligence and the value that can be generated for uh, using, uh, using our imagery to these final customers. Um, we found that uh, to work much better than us packaging an analytic service ourselves with our own imagery data, uh, and then going after these multi uh, stakeholders in all of these different industries, because there's always different processes for different verticals, based, especially if you're looking at different geographical areas. Um, so we're using these analytics businesses, which are who are much smaller in number compared to the amount of farmers and the mines and the oil and gas companies that we have out there. 
But because the number of customers become smaller, we're, we're, we are still serving that larger market because our imagery is still being used uh, through uh, them as a conduit to these much larger uh, you know, verticals. Um, so we're using that strategy to uh, basically go out and capture the much larger, uh, uh, mar uh, much larger customer base uh, in those markets. Um, but because these analytics companies are uh, very, uh, again, as you know, going back to the previous point, they are uh, uh, quite localized. It does make us it help us. Uh, it does make it easier for us to reach out to those who are much more local and closer to us geographically. That is some of the strategies uh, that we have in terms of how we want to be uh, commercializing the data that we capture. Where are you there, actually located? Sorry, um, sorry, Dave, I'll give it back to you. No, no, no Where worries. are you actually located? Uh, we're based in Melbourne, Australia. And then uh, in, in terms of these da data analytic uh, companies, what, what does that universe look like? How, uh, how, many, how many of those firms are out there and so forth? So the, the market with the value added services or the analytic services oh, that comes with this imagery data is actually much bigger than the, data, uh, than the market for the imagery itself. Um, like in some of our estimations, as I've shown, you know, our time gives us around 4.12 billion, but some estimates show for the value added services to be around uh, uh, 14 billion. Now, this is obviously along with uh, all the other trends as, as you know, space becomes a lot, uh, the data from space becomes a lot more accessible. There's a lot of these analytics companies, whether they be startups or much more uh, established SMEs as they're coming up. Uh, the market around that is expanding. Um, right now, we can see it's somewhat smaller and it's easier for us to go out and reach uh, out to these customers because they are uh, comparatively new in the market. Um, uh, but because this market is also growing and uh, pretty much uh, a lot of the firms, whether it be a lot of the agricultural firms are now trying to have this type of analytic services in-house as well. Um, they're turning themselves into these type of companies. It's uh, becoming a lot more uh, viable for us uh, to position ourselves as a data uh, as a data producer and then be selling to these companies uh, just because the market around that is uh, much bigger and is also fastly growing it and it's also quickly growing. Okay, I'd like to get uh, Amoresh in here now. Uh, thank you, Tom. And thank you, Shoaib, for the uh, presentation. Um, I do have a several questions. I used to work uh, very, very closely in this sector. And so this is a wonderful, uh, I think more companies should jump into this space. I think there's definitely promise in it. Um, my question is actually similar as an extension of what Dave just asked um, with respect to the analyst companies that you're selling to. Um, there are quite a few out there. A lot of them are, are organized by sector, as you know, because they have specialties in each individual sector. Um, my question is how much of the 78 million in commitments is from the, these companies and how much is actually the end customer themselves? And then... Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Orbital Insight. Would they be a potential customer as well? Um, the entirety of the 78 million is from these analytics companies themselves. Uh, the entire majority is from the ones who are actually going to be analyzing the, that data and then reselling the intelligence to the uh, final stakeholder, which is the farmer. And when it comes to Orbital Insights, definitely as they are all marketing themselves as an analyst company uh, who utilizes space data instead of you know, having their own assets in space, they are also a potential customer for us. And you uh, mentioned the 4.1 billion TAM and how that is actually much larger when you look at the actual end product, the, the analyzed intelligence, if you will, that goes to the end customer. So that 4.1 is based purely on imagery sales, just square kilometer of imagery sales. Okay. That's correct. And who, who is the dominant player right now in, in that space, just selling raw imagery? Um. In terms of selling raw imagery, are you asking about our direct competitors or an you're, analytics company? Your right. direct competitors, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, we our niche uh, as as a as our niche, we're specifically looking at hyperspectral imagery data. Uh, some of the competitors that are being mentioned as Satellogic and Orbital uh, uh, Orbital Sidekick. Uh, 
those are the two that we do uh, know of and the ones who are in orbit and are selling that imagery data. Of course, there are quite a few hyperspectral satellites uh, that are operated by uh, uh, by government-owned entities. We know that uh, we know of Prisma. While most of it is only for uh, non-civilian use, um, there are quite a few uh, competitors within China as well. Uh, we know of Zuhai Orbiter, who is uh, uh, who currently has a, a hyperspectral well constellation or currently operating. Um, they are some of the ones who are selling this imagery data right now. But if you're looking at this specific niche, uh, if you're looking at someone who's trying, who's selling, you know, millions of dollars of imagery data uh, annually, currently we do not have uh, someone like that in this uh, specific niche. Of course, we are competing with other data types depending on the application use case. We, uh, some, most of our customers currently use free data sets such as, 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 such as the ones from Sentinel and some are uh, depending on their data sets, depending on their applications, their uh, buying imagery data from Airbus and uh, for their specific applications. Um, but the, the based on, but we are trying to market ourselves at this uh, specific niche. Uh, so we are looking at some very uh, specific problems to these customers. So while they might be somewhat competing with us, uh, right now there is not a huge dominant player who, will, uh, who can essentially, uh, who currently has uh, hyperspectral satellites out there. Okay, we need to move on now, but uh, Shraib, thank you so much. Thank you very you much, very interesting. Thank yeah. you. Okay, thank, thanks for that great kickoff to our, our program today. Um, next up, I'm not seeing him, I hope he's here, uh, Johans from Celestial Space Technologies. There he is. Yes, hello, I'm here. Can everybody yeah. hear me? Oh yeah, you're fine. Perfect. So you can share your screen anytime, and uh, when you start talking, I'll start timing. Perfect. Can you, you see my my screen? Sure can. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. And um, then I would like to start now. So. Hello, everybody. My name is Johannes. I am one of the founders of um, Celestial and, and at Celestial. We want to redefine satellite communication because the problem we see in the space industry at the moment is that small satellites have limitations in available power, available volume, and also regarding the lifetime. And then we consider the high mission failure rates up to 50% for the industry and 30% for academia, and also high deorbiting rates. There's a total of lost assets of 150 million euros from these uh, failed and deorbited de uh, satellites. So we're looking to tackle these issues from the telecommunication side. We're looking to offer remotely reconfigurable communication systems and uh, high performance and still low cost custom antennas and also highly integrated multifunctional systems. What that actually means, we will get to in the following slides. But overall, the value we provide is uh, customized systems and we're optimizing both the power and the volume on satellites. And by that, effectively, we extend the satellite lifetime, also mission range and, and eventually also performance uh, capabilities. So in the two images below, you see two of our products. On the right side is an SDR-based communication system. And on the left side is a patch antenna, which is also on the market um, as we speak. So, and we also did a comparison with our competition, of course, which is summarized in this diagram. So the blue circle is our antenna, gray circles are competing antennas, size of the circle is uh, the cost of the system, and vertical axis actually is performance. And when you can see is our, what you can see is our antenna is about three times as, as performant as the general baseline of, of the industry. And that's really the conclusion that uh, we draw from this comparison our performance over, over size and over price ratio is very high, which is also our main competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. And the value chain and the satellite industry, we are fairly high upstream focused. We provide components and subsystems for our satellites. And the way we deliver this is the circle in the center. So at first, um, we talk to our customers about the emission requirements, but then Celestial actually is a design and engineering company. 
which means we design antennas, we select material and components, and everything that follows after that, manufacturing, testing, post-processing, that is outsourced. Now, eventually, we also potentially talk to customers about integration and help them, but we focus on design and engineering, and that also helps us in for scalability. Um, because when we consider that there's 10,000 satellites planned to be launched this um, uh, this uh, decade, and um, one third of them is operating also in S and X band, which is what we have antennas for on the market, we can we can serve them because multiple antennas typically require multiple um, antennas for redundancy, and also when we look at upcoming mega constellations. Um, they require similar antennas or the same antennas. So these antennas we have to design once and we can manufacture mul mul um, multiple of them. So that helps us in scaling our business model because we focus on development and we can scale anyway because um, despite being hardware, fo hardware uh, heavy. Looking at our upcoming R&D, and this is now where we get to the interesting part of the multifunctional systems. We are looking to develop a solar panel integrated antenna, um, which is, as you can see in the images, it is an integrated uh, solar panel and antenna, which means it acts as a, it generates electricity and makes power available and still also operates as an antenna. That's both payloads are integrated into a single system. They're no longer separate, and this is something new on the market. We are not aware of anything similar. And in the next step, next year, we want to make this system also deployable, which is very, which is a very interesting system, um, especially when we consider um, this is relevant for the upcoming mega constellations because they um, they rely heavily on inter-satellite communication links, um, and specifically for this use case, our antenna is very interesting because when when we combine multiple payloads which are usually separate and we make one of them we free up space which means the individual satellites can take up multiple antennas communicate in more directions and that's exactly what they need when they when they want to communicate to satellites all around them and not only to the ground so the main application is obviously in satellite communication, but this is also relevant for deep space and lunar missions, and even for drone applications. We talked to the industry about this idea and this concept, and they liked us a lot. We also have three letters of intent from our use from our, from our user segment, um, and the overall benefit we provide with this system is really high volume availability and an improvement of the overall link and power budget on the satellite. Who are our customers and where are they? So in general, you can say that all our customers are all organizations who develop, launch, and operate satellites. This can be startups, universities, agencies, bigger companies. And three quarters of them actually are in US and Asia. But we want to be global. Our customers are also global, and we want to go to all of the big uh, geographical markets. And we also have ideas and uh, strategies prepared on how to enter those uh, markets. But looking at the market overall, globally, when we look at the satellite antenna market for ground and space segment, that totals to a 30 billion euro market. And off of that, when we look at satellite antenna for space only in our frequency range uh, that we have developed already, this is still 600 million euros uh, market um, left. And off of that, we, are, we estimate that we can obtain 80 million euros and the drone market is only on top of that. But these estimations of what we can obtain, our financial forecast, our sales forecast, is in the diagram on the left side. We expect to be, after we develop um, actually multiple products, to be cash flow positive already next year in July. And then the year after that, we expect to have a break even. And at the end of the projection timeline, which is end of 2026, we expect to have a revenue of 12 million euros and uh, 3 million euro in profits. And we expect to have sold over 600 units. So where's this revenue coming from? This is summarized on the right side, um, the bar, the stick graph. Um, and you can see the base of our products. That's the blue, that's the patch antenna, which is on the market already. But the biggest revenue drivers will be next year, the solar panel antenna in orange and the year after that, especially that the deployable solar panel integrated antenna, those will be the main revenue drivers um, for our financial forecast. So who is Celestial and the team? 
Celestial was uh, founded by my colleague Mayank, he's a space engineer, he's also in this call, and uh, myself, an industrial engineer by background. We are actually around for a while, three and a half years, and we've um, won a few awards and competitions, most notably third place in the Inner Space Masters Challenge. We were part of the Luna 2020 analog uh, mission. We won the Space Award there. We completed ESA BIC, and also Celestial offered um, engineering workshop at ETH Zurich. And Celestial really is a company that's developing innovative ICT solutions for data-driven industries. And we, of course, focus on satellite communication um, and space applications in general. Our headquarters is in Germany, and we have a subsidiary also in Luxembourg. And uh, most notably, we have an upcoming uh, technology demonstration mission for end of this year. So on the right side, top right, you see our antenna being integrated into the satellite already now and waiting for launch at the end of uh, this year. Right now, we are looking for actually um, distribution partners. As I mentioned, we have antenna products on the markets um, that um, we can serve and deliver right now. So we're looking for companies who have uh, small satellite subsystem catalogs and who would like to um, have also more antennas in their catalogs. We can provide a very high performance antenna right now for this catalog and we would like to sign this, this partnership. And we're also looking to pri for private funding, roughly 1 million euro in equity funding to develop products um, uh, that I outlined and to, to, um, to aid our R&D. The exit prospects that we can offer to investors is most likely uh, acquisition by a large space company who is also developing uh, satellites. And um, this can happen as soon as our revenue is uh, going up, so actually within uh, five years. And of course, we're also looking for pilot projects in orbit demonstration missions for the solar panel integrated antennas and deployable versions um, and starting next year already. And the main use of our funds will be actually in delivering our um, serving customers. And a big part of that will go to salaries, which for us is also R&D because we do development and engineering. So thank you for your attention up until this, up until this point, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Donna, that was, that was great. You just hit just under the mark. It was absolutely perfect. I loved it. Um, thank you. Okay, yeah, that was great. I keep the slides up. Amaresh, I want to lead off with you this time. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Johanna's great presentation. Um, I, my first question is around competitors. Uh, can you talk a bit more on who else currently does this and who your competitive, like what the competitive landscape looks like? Yeah, sure, I'm going back to the slides, um, our comparison. So notable, notable competitors are, for example, AnyWaves. Uh, it's a French-based company. We have IQ Wireless, they're based in Germany. Uh, there's EnduroSat. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure where they are based. It's, it's, I think it's somewhere in, in Europe and there is ISI space. So these are companies who are all developing uh, patch antennas, satellite patch antennas. We looked at them, actually we got uh, data sheets and the data specs of their antennas or of their um, patch antenna, which is similar to the s band patch antenna that we have um, right now. And we did this benchmarking, comparing the performance, which to explain this diagram, what performance is, it is antenna gain, which is the antenna capability to increase uh, the signal strength over the antenna size, so volume um, multiplied by weight. Um, and the size of the bubble is the price. So then you factor all of this in, we get to this, uh, this performance um, indicator where we rank very high because we have a great ratio of uh, gain over size. So our antenna is really, the, let's say the antenna model that we have designed and tested and which is on the satellite and being in space end of this year. This is for high gain, uh, this is a high gain antenna. So that's for, for companies um, who want to have, for example, high data rates. But this is a very specific antenna. We are aware that um, most missions actually will need a customized solution. And this may be even low gain, and this may they require maybe higher bandwidth. So where we, why we have this uh, antenna design ready, uh, what we actually also provide is our capabilities to design for any mission 
characteristic. And this would be a new antenna, a new antenna design, um, which will be different and will be tailored. And uh, then you would have to have a different benchmarking. But this is now for this example a case for the antenna that we have tested. And um, where we think sure. we, we rank uh, very high and very good. And so I, I know that you're producing uh, additional product lines as we go forward over the next few years, like uh, solar arrays and the like. But let's focus on the antenna specifically. Um, what type of satellite is the optimal satellite as a customer for you? Um, mass wise, uh, use case wise, and maybe you could list some potential customers uh, by name. So right now our antenna, um, our S band antenna is one U. It is uh, just short of 10 by 10 centimeters. It's a flat patch. And we have an X band antenna, which is uh, 34 by 34 millimeters. So also fits to one U satellites. Um, that would be ideal. One U or few U satellites. Uh, because then we don't have to customize this uh, this antenna or the size of this antenna by uh, by a lot. So these small satellite and small satellite missions, those are our ideal customers. But what we develop, as I said, customize antennas, and we can make this antenna bigger. It's not a problem. We have the capabilities to basically design antennas, and this can be almost any size. So it doesn't really matter how big the big the um, satellite is. What we would like to see um, is a customer which who is launching a constellation of multiple um, multiple uh, satellites. Uh, of course, just for economics, uh, because this will be a bigger order uh, for us, and we will make uh, more revenue. Of course, it's better commercially speaking. Um, specific companies that uh, we are looking to serve. Um, um, Satellogic uh, was mentioned before, uh, which is a satellite developer. Planets would be a big one, for example. Then there's companies like OneWeb, um, who are developing big constellations. Uh, but then there's also many companies who are small, or let's say small teams who are younger, who are launching individual satellites. This can even be satellite agencies. And those are most notably from countries which have not in, not, which don't have decades of uh, space experience. This could be an agency somewhere in South Africa, South America for example, or the Arabic countries, and also universities who are launching student projects. So it's very, very broad. Um, I'll save my last question if we have time, but over to uh, Dave and Eva. Yeah, Eva, why don't you go? What do you got? Um, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, so when I will, at the beginning, you talked about the problems um, that the small satellite issues face. And I got to say, I am a little confused because I'm not sure how this actually solves any of those particular problems. I mean, it may solve problems yeah. in terms of the, in sure. terms of the, um, uh, the antenna market specifically, but I didn't see how it solved any of the other problems you had. Yeah, I understand the confusion. Uh, there's simply not enough time to tell the entire story. So thanks for the question. I can get into that right now. When we talk about mission failures, uh, there's a study and there's up to 30% of mission failures is due to the communication system, including antennas. They're simply not, uh, not reliable enough. We want to make them more reliable. And then when we talk about the lost assets, this is satellites are being deorbited. And those are satellites who fulfilled uh, their mission um, their mission objectives. And after that happens, they will be deorbited. They will not be used for follow-up missions, typically. We want to offer reconfigurable communication systems. That's another project which we have in the pipeline. And also our antenna, which are basically capable to work across a bigger spectrum of uh, bigger frequency spectrum and actually on multiple central frequencies. So that when your satellite finished its objective of the primary mission, it can be recommissioned maybe to a different orbit under different communication characteristics, and in that sense, reused. So you don't have to send uh, uh, another satellite um, for another mission. So we're looking to tackle this from this perspective, um, really extending the communication, ca communication capabilities of these satellites and making it more reliable so actually less satellites uh, are required and they can be 
increasingly reused. And how about vertical? And, and like a lot, it seems to me a lot of um, the constellations in particular have a high degree of um, internal, verti so vertical integration from the perspective that they are made inside. There's not a lot of outsourcing that goes on, some more than others. Um, any yeah. comment on that? Because that obviously, if they're going yeah. to build it themselves, you don't have a, you don't have a customer. Sure. Yeah, that's correct. And the number for that is probably 88. So there was this study that says um, if you do a 3U CubeSat constellation and it's bigger than 88 satellites, then it makes economically sense for you to uh, manufacture yourself. Um, absolutely. So this is also why um, we are targeting smaller missions, small constellations, because for them it makes economically sense to still outsource all of that. Um, but these bigger missions are still a target for us because, as I mentioned, we we develop, we do engineering, we don't do manufacturing. So even if the the constellation is doing the manufacturing themselves, we can still pres pres uh, provide um, antenna uh, design, antenna engineering. Uh, this is basically our core competency um, that we can still sell antenna designs to them and still they do the manufacturing themselves but that's okay because we don't do manufacturing anyway but then also this gets back to our solar panel integrated antenna so this is a antenna which is specifically interesting for um, large constellations as i mentioned integrating multiple uh, payloads into one so it can have additional antennas you can communicate into multiple directions um, I'm not aware of any other company who is working on that who, or who was even offering that. So that's really a product that right now I think we are the only one out there working on. Um, and uh, this is specifically of interest to bigger constellations. Um, and this is also a system. And there's, there's no set up production line for this because it's new, basically. Okay. Uh David, um, yeah. get, get you in here real quick. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two really quick questions as we're yeah, on so, so, run, so, sorry. So, so given that uh, uh, this is uh, a new type of uh, antenna, the talk about the, the time frame and the engineering uh, for the satellite companies to engineer that, and, and might that impact uh, your, your ability to uh, sell these antennas going forward? So our development stage for this is we have the design ready. You see on the image, there's actually a screenshot of the designing software. Right now, we are mainly raising funds to prototype this, to manufacture this, to test this. Um, and we want to get this done basically by the end of this year. So by the end of the year, we want to have all of this um, ready and tested, uh, both from communication testing, but also um, solar uh, panel testing. And then we're looking for innova demonstration. So as soon as this is uh, basically tested, it is also qualified for space. So starting next year, we want to have this on the market, um, maybe even before we do the IOD, but it's still nonetheless on the market, uh, maybe without flight heritage, but it is still nonetheless uh, qualified. Um, the production line for all of that is actually already set up. We did the entire research, and we also identified um, R&D partners and suppliers for every subsystem. Basically, we're looking for that funding, and this will be then uh, ready uh, next year already. In terms of supplying any customers, um, as I mentioned, we, we, we do design and engineering, and uh, we also notice that our antennas will not be supplied off the shelf. Um, instead, every antenna to a certain degree has to be tailored. So we expect that we have to find customers early, early, in uh, satellite development to really align their mission um, um, requirements with our design. So they have to provide that. And uh, this can, I mean, maybe we have to be in contact with them as, as much as one year before they actually manufacture a satellite. Uh, that, that also depends on who we are talking to. But there is a long development, a long uh, fulfillment cycle, um, I would say. So we have to contact them uh, very early in their development stage. And this is uh, currently actually our challenge to, to find them in an early stage. 
All right, we have to cut off there. I'm sorry, we need to move on. You need to move on. Thank you, Johan. Um, you can give back your screen. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. Okay, next up. Next up is Egbert Edelbrook from Spaceborn United. I think you're going to find this very interesting. Yes, can you see my screen? Sure can. Thank you. Be a Thank little you. louder, otherwise you're you're fine. Yeah, perfect. I'll just talk a little bit louder. We've had there this, you go. Uh, That's this good. Issue. Perfect. Yep. Thank you for your uh, introduction, uh, Thomas. So I am uh, Egbert, founder and CEO of Spaceborne United, and let me invite you uh, on a brief journey through space and time. So imagine. For the first time in history, our babies can be conceived in space. Imagine a few years later when they can also be born in space. Imagine these next steps in our evolution becoming a reality. Is this science fiction? No, this is science fix, the science facts, and we are making it possible. In doing so, we provide the missing link in becoming a multiplanetary species. NASA, ESA, SpaceX, and others are preparing for human settlements on Mars, and they want them to become independent. That means they all, that also requires learning how to reproduce beyond Earth in different gravity environments, a, a challenge very difficult to address by large agencies and corporations. Fortunately, they explicitly encourage focused biotech companies to address this crucial challenge. So we are this focused biotech company addressing exactly this challenge. We research the conditions for human reproduction in space. We use research that, that was done by others and extended. We translate the outcomes into missions and a missions program to enable the different stages of human reproduction. Our space life science work especially focuses on developing the biomedical equipment required for the missions we develop. This is a large part of our work. We start with the first stages of reproduction, conception and early embryo development. Meanwhile, we are also working on longer term missions that, for example, enable childbirth in space. We have world-class support from various research and industry partners. But who is paying for this and why would they? We explored several business opportunities. We identified uh, and validated a short list of possible profitable business cases, short-term, mid-term and long-term. We also reached out to these customer segments and got really good responses. We still have some homework in fine tuning the validation, but we get a lot of support with that from experts from the space industry. More about the business in a minute. Let me first introduce you to our team. So the core founding team consists of, well, myself, obviously, and then there is Dave Cullen. He has been supervising most of our research projects for the last four years. And he is a professor and space biotechnology expert at Cranfield University. And there is Dr. Nancy Berham, an obstetrician and gynecologist with over 20 years of experience, she knows all we need to know about reproductive challenges. She specializes in high risk situations and also researches options for childbirth in microgravity. Then we have Brian, our main business expert, a very successful serial entrepreneur and space tech startup mentor. Dr. Westphal is a very experienced embryologist and former IVF clinic manager providing all we need to know about IVF technology and embryo development. And finally, Professor Zwenne, our IP expert and experienced, experienced top lawyer. On the background, oh, sorry. On the background, by the way, you see the UFO shaped building in the Netherlands where we rent office space for our headquarters. 
We are very happy to work with our other team members and our growing group of international experts and advisors, addressing the various matters from bio biomedical, space technological, ethical, legal, and business development angles. Um, for this slide, I selected the most important people, but there are many others as well with valuable contributions. The same gratitude we have for the research and industry support on several essential uh, areas regarding mission architecture and payload development. And it's not just technology, it also includes business case validation. Time to move on to the how question. So let me explain how our technology works and how it enables and supports our missions. So we are extending existing assisted reproductive technology like IVF. And we make that work in space as well. So for our first mission, we enable conception and early embryo development in low earth orbit. We are developing these biocassettes that you see that function as a life support system during five day missions. We combine the key technologies that are mentioned to develop and align the different layers and functionalities in these biocassettes. We also provide artificial gravity to ensure healthy embryo development. So we combine multiple of these discs, biocassettes, together in a pressurized casing, uh, which goes on board the recoverable biosatellite and into the rocket. One of the best options for our launch provider is Virgin Orbit's Launcher One system. We aligned our requirements with them and the Launcher One is flexible in terms of launch locations. It has proven technology and it allows for very late access to our payload, which we need. So we use a dedicated flight and no ride sharing. We do not depend on this launch system and we also have other options. So we have developed a mission profile and payload protocol that addresses all the biological steps and is aligned with the payload requirements and the participants throughout all the mission stages. I'm not going to explain all these details now, but this, is, this shows the general mission architecture. Of course, there's a whole process behind the scenes prior to preparing missions like these. When we started some five years ago, we had to work on several milestones first. Our concept needed to add serious value for both science and business, and also needed to succeed in feasibility studies. So we redesigned the concept several times to achieve this. And it also enabled us to find execution partners and align with internationally supported research roadmaps. So from around 2019, we could focus on our biomedical device, our embryo incubator with the biocassettes I just showed and continue to raise the technical readiness level. On the side, we also continue to prepare other missions, enabling, for example, childbirth in space in the long run. But it's time for the business perspective. From the different business cases we explored, the most profitable and feasible turns out to be the participating uh, very wealthy people. They are willing to pay a large amount of money to be able to let their children become part of history. More specifically, uh, we mean the ultra high net worth individuals. Um, worldwide, a group of almost 300,000 people. With a mission cost of around 10 to $12 million, we expect to make a 30 to $40 million profit per mission. On the longer term, our missions program provides additional revenue streams. Um, we have the upcoming space nations like the United Arab Emirates that show serious interest in our projects. We are actually invited to present our projects in front of the royal family. Um, they want to be able to claim unique achievements in the new space race. And there's other customer segments. Our science output and technological innovations appear to have significant value as well for space research centers and for the IVF sector. As we figure out the way to safely re reproduce in space, we end up with a crucial and valuable proposition 
for agencies and companies that aim for human settlements. And our last slide for finalizing the preparation of our first missions, we aim to raise $3 million, which will be allocated to these budgets. Thank you for your time. Uh, we'll be happy to answer your questions. Okay, thank you. Great presentation as everybody. Uh, Dave, I cut you short this last time. I'd like to lead off with you. Yes, have have you uh, experienced working with the uh, the ultra rich in the past? Yeah, we have people in the team that that have worked for shipyards and that were responsible for organizing extremely uh, expensive presents that cost over a hundred k per per piece. Um, so, and we have a few other people that that have worked with them, indeed. So, so is is there uh, any any kind of competition uh, set up uh, uh, to 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 be conceived or or to be born in space? Is 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 that a thing? If if you you follow what I'm saying? Um, well, for 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 humanity in general, it's a must. It's inevitable. We have to do this. It's it's a long roadmap. We have to start uh, as soon as possible. But for uh, customer segments, uh, it is um, there are there is competition, of course. I'm, I'm sure you have witnessed uh, Blue Origin and, and, and Virgin Virgin Galactic uh, sending uh, space tourists into space. That's also a life changing event for the high net worth individuals or the ultra high net worth. Um, but it's just, it's yes, it is a thing. Um, it, it's inevitable. We have to do this. There is upcoming space nations that want to to uh, support and fund our, our projects that seem to to be willing to. Uh, and there is, well, I, I'm sure you also remember the Mars One project some six years ago. Uh, hundred, hundreds of thousands of people were willing to to go on on, on a crazy mission like this, which mm. was well. There is. We only need so. We only need a few people who want to do this, and, and we expect from those three hundred thousand people that at least uh, three hundred uh, will be very uh, will be showing very serious interest. And we Great, only need you. ten or thirty. Okay, Amaresh, how about you? Sure, uh, Egbert. Thank you for the presentation. Um, to say that you have a unique company is uh, selling it short. This is a quite quite a novel concept. So a couple of questions. What, what is an IVF chip? An IVF chip, um, uh, in vitro fertilization, like IVF clinics use. What? Well, yes. Um, huh? um, and they are making these processes smaller and more effective. Um, with with uh, uh, making it so as small as 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 possible to to even make it fit. On a chip and to automate uh, processes that are uh, at this moment mainly been done by expensive uh, analysts with, with with manual labor they're trying to automate it and make it make okay. it smaller and more uh, effective and efficient sure but so you're not talking about a silicon chip not a computer chip no no got it That's okay I, I'm, I didn't quite grasp that but um what are the primary uh issues that are foreseen right now for conceiving in space. Like what, what problem are you addressing with this new approach or technology? Yeah, the, 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 the scientific added value is um, uh, filling the many data gaps in the partial gravity area. So we know practically um, everything about normal earth gravity. We know um, quite a bit about microgravity, but we know hardly anything about everything in between the partial gravity area. So with our um, uh, research platform, we can learn um, if, for example, the Mars gravity environment will provide sufficient gravity for healthy embryo development, for humans, for mammalians, for even for terraforming in the long, in the long term, and, and selecting the right mammals that can thrive uh, in a Mars environment. Sure. So the, the, main, the main variables obviously would be uh, gravity, variation, mm -hmm. partial gravity, like you mentioned, or changes in gravity over time. Yes. And possibly radiation as well. Yes. And, we, and pressure variances. Can any of that be simulated here on Earth? 
Yes, they can. We, we work with the, the Belgium Nuclear Research Center. Uh, they're also working on, on, on pharmaceuticals that enhance radio, uh, radiation resistance. Uh, but we don't have to apply that yet because we stay well under the norms for radiation for embryo development because it's only a five to six day mission in a certain uh, chosen um, altitude and inclination. Okay, and last question quickly. Um, how is Paragon involved? Uh, there are, of course, uh, world leaders in, in, in life support systems, both uh, human size, but also on the small size. And they're um, helping with the thermal controls. That's another of their expertise. So they will be involved uh, in, in the, they are involved in the, in the, in the stage where we go to um, prototype. Oh, and, uh, and by the way, who's, uh, who are you flying uh, at the end of the year on version orbit? Um, so which, which IVS samples are you flying? Um, we will, of course, start with, with animal cell samples, with validation okay. missions to, to comply with all the ethical committees. Um, and we don't have, we, we are not worried that we will find participants that will um, provide the cell samples. So we don't have those customers yet, but okay. we are 1000% confident that we will find a thousand fold more than we can work with. Okay. Similar to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the Mars One uh, project. Similar to Mars One, yeah. Yeah, there will uh, be a lot of people that want to be in these reboots or supporting life, space life science research, etc. Right, but for this upcoming mission, it's uh, animal cells. Yes, yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Eva, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, it's uh, definitely unique, I agree. Um, it, it, still strikes me as less of a business and more of a um, experiment that government funding might be more appropriate for. That's my initial reaction, but it's fascinating. Um, and obviously long term, it's an issue. But um, I've got to say, my only uh, one of my observations is if I were to have a child who was conceived in space, I'd want to do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I appreciate that. So sending up, and unless I couldn't get pregnant anyhow, sending up an IV sa IVF sample to, to, and then having it implanted just doesn't seem to have the cachet of, you know, the old fashioned way. It, it requires a very innovative mindset, but fortunately, there seem to be a, a lot of those people as well. But okay, I, I understand well, most people will, will think this is a little bit, uh, uh, well, special. Yeah. I, I mean, there's going to be lots of problems, and uh, obviously, before um, anybody can be born in space, or you you have there's lots of th things that can go wrong. So it's a great experiment to be doing. Is there any terrestrial applications from this? Like, is there anything that you can use your technology that you're developing on Earth to make early sales until the longer term kicks in? Yeah, I can imagine that that's the, uh, I saw that question coming, obviously. Um, we haven't pinpointed those, uh, those spin-offs yet, but all of our experts, they're pretty much um, um, convinced that there will be a spin-off for the IVF sector as we are uh, automating the steps in that process um, that, that will be beneficial for the IVF sector, but we haven't pinpointed it specifically yet. And the same goes for the long-term missions uh, as well. And also, um, so that's a really a terrestrial application. And, and are you thinking, last, yeah. so, so here's an idea. Um, if um, Are you thinking, first of all, what might be an idea is to have a pet. I mean, you know, instead of having a mouse as your first sample, you know, a cat or a dog who is conceived in space to me is more of a, something that somebody may, you know, considering how much people pay for pets these days, and COVID has made the prices even more higher, a pet conceived in space could be really an attractive idea. You, you are actually not even the first with this idea, and, and we are open for those ideas. We, 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 we think that that could be a feasible a business case, but we haven't explored it in much detail because we also wanted to keep our scientific focus uh, uh, as pure as possible, but that shouldn't have to conflict. And it's certainly, uh, I think it will be feasible. We, we believe it is, and it's worthwhile uh, exploring further. 
And one last thing about uh, government funding, it's uh, practically impossible for large agencies because they are working with taxpayer money and, and they see it as a potential PR disaster to spend taxpayer money on delicate matters like, like space life science, especially reproduction in space. So they are explicitly encouraging uh, companies to do it. Mm. Okay, interesting. Thanks. Very yeah. interesting. Okay, I guess we're gonna be moving on then. Uh, Aver, thank you so much. Great, My great pleasure. presentation. All right, and finally, let me reset my trusty timer. We have uh, we have Melissa Roth from uh, Off Planet Research. Good morning. You need to unmute yourself. Ah, okay. It wasn't there giving you me that as an option a minute ago. Perfect. Okay. Uh, one moment while we get the slides pulled up. Let me know when you see it in presentation mode and we'll get going. All right, whenever you're ready, I'll push the button. Perfect. So hello, uh, we are Melissa Roth and Vince Rue, the co-founders and lead researchers at Off Planet Research based in Washington State. Off Planet Research is developing a self-cleaning dust and regolith tolerant connector that can be used for either gas or fluid transfer on the surface of the moon, Mars, or other worlds. The connector does not rely on soft seals that will quickly become brittle due to intense temperatures or volatile depletion in the vacuum of space. It will be well suited for use in the ultra cold permanently shadowed regions of the moon and is adaptable for quick operation by a robot or suited astronaut. The return to the moon and the moon to Mars strategy requires the ability for missions to support themselves with in situ resources and support each other through forward and lateral compatibility. One critical part is the capacity to repeatedly connect various vital systems and transfer gases and fluids with a high degree of reliability. This will require connectors and other hardware that are able to function in the dusty and extreme environments of other worlds. More rugged connectors are needed for construction, volatile transfer and processing, and life support systems, including the transfer of air, water, carbon dioxide, and waste. In order to achieve that vision of long-term robotic and human presence in space, there are several issues that need to be overcome. These include commodity loss due to seal failure, failures, limited EVAs from these leakage rates and the risk to human life, the slow process of designing and qualifying one-off connectors for every mission, and the long lead time and limited supply of qualified connectors. The prolonged lifespan of our connectors will increase payload and production efficiency, as well as the mission return from those valuable EVAs. We are focusing on their interoperability with a standardized design to help meet the expanding cadence of missions. By establishing a consistent manufacturing process, we will be able to be a reliable supplier for the space industry. Apollo surface operations showed the aggressiveness of the regolith and how it affects technology. Our connector employs several layers of innovation to achieve the goal of reliable, long-term, and repeated use while transferring gases and fluids in the dusty environments off Earth. The connectors are self-cleaning with no soft materials to degrade in the vacuum and temperature extremes of space. This may enable their use in, for cryogenic fluid transfer and within the PSRs at lunar poles. The special geometry of the ceiling surfaces makes the connectors more robust against regolith particles and thermal expansion or contraction. The connectors can be scaled to a range of sizes and the metal can be used, uh, that is used can vary according to the application need. The space market for these connectors includes commercial and government operators on the surface of the moon and other worlds who will need to transfer fluids or gases between systems, landers, or rovers. The terrestrial markets are mining, aerospace, industrial, agriculture, and medical operations where contamination in transferred fluids or gases is a concern. Off-Planet Research participated in a market research program in the fall of 2020 
utilizing a broad scan approach to identify the customer segments, their overlapping needs, and projected timelines. The interviews provided valuable information on some of the minimum viable products our potential customers are looking for, as well as a range of practical metrics. We believe that ISRU demonstrators who are proving their high TRL processes work in relevant environments will be our innovators and spacesuit and life support system developers will be our early adopters. These are segments which are being forced to the front by the requirements of the current space program and they are receiving grant funding or supply awards. The development timeline for bringing these prototype connectors to the space market is about two to three years based on the progress made during our NASA SVIR. Engineering articles are expected to be available in Q3 to Q4 of 2023. We anticipate production of flight-ready connectors by Q3 to Q4 of 2024 to help support upcoming HLS and ISRU missions. Our flight-ready connectors can be produced by existing aerospace machine shops and finishing companies. We are developing relationships with several machine shops to ensure that we have redundancies in place in case of production issues to maintain quality control, and to sustain competitive pricing. We plan to produce connectors based on orders to limit production overhead, and off-planet research will focus on the design and integration into the client system. The most likely competitors during this time include Apollo era connectors, which are still in use, the dust tolerant automated umbilical from NASA, and IBOS from the German Aerospace Center. Electrical or orbital connectors are peripheral competitors and include connectors from Honey e Robotics, TE Connectivity, Space Industries, and Amtec. Breaking into terrestrial markets will be more difficult due to the number of established companies. However, this presents the opportunity to license RIP to larger terrestrial connector manufacturers rather than compete with them. Uh, the, this will allow us to maintain our focus on space while benefiting from the great potential for terrestrial sales by leveraging the larger market share of more established companies. As more dangerous industries like mining transition away from human workers and towards robotics and automation, long lasting connectors will become even more valuable here on earth. With six years as a company and almost $600,000 in revenue, we have gone through the R&D process many times to create new simulants. Having been awarded two phase one SPIRs, we are familiar process of moving from concept to design to testing and reviewing prototypes. Our team of researchers and engineers has a broad base of knowledge and experience working with lunar regolith simulants and understanding their qualities as well as component testing in an active regolith environment. We have two knowledgeable and actively involved industry mentors, which include a retired commercial space executive, an experienced DOD contractor and business owner. The total addressable market in the near term is composed mostly of space applications where the connector performance is critical. Given the largely unsatisfied need for these connectors, it's reasonable that our share of the TAM for the space market would be about 50%. Within a two to three year sales window, it is likely that the market size for these space rated connectors is at least 100 units. This market includes actual launched missions, prototype system development, testing, and sales for future use. We use the cost of production of the latest connector design to estimate the ROM production cost of the final connector. For a connector set, which includes additional features of a clamshell dust cover and a dust removal cup, we anticipate a total sale price of $24,000 with a 25% profit margin. Based on estimated two to three year sales of 50 connectors, we expect total sales of $1.2 million within that initial window. With the increased frequency and longer duration of missions, as well as developing lunar infrastructure, we expect future sales to greatly increase and the profit margin to go up. The terrestrial market is much higher volume, even for specialty connectors. One of the biggest players, Parker Hannafin, is a $14 billion business. We believe the connector portion of the global companies like Parker is, is approximately $60 billion from licensing our goal is $6 million in this window. Under a phase one SBIR, our previous connector efforts have focused on developing the geometry and features of the threads, mating structures, and gas purging system, as well as verifying the general design will clear dust. We have also designed and tested a, pro a developmental prototype clamshell dust cover 
and dust removal cup as additional layers of dust protection. We are looking for additional funding to develop fully functioning engineering articles to undergo flight qualification and certification. These technologies include our self-cleaning, dust tolerant connector with valves and fluids our valves and filters for transferring fluids and gases, the clamshell dust cover, and the dust removal cup. The budget for moving from developmental prototypes to engineering articles that have undergone flight qualification and certification is approximately $800,000. We anticipate the first exit opportunity for investors in year three. Thank you for your time and we welcome any questions. Okay, great, you came in under time, good for you. Great, great job. Uh, Eva Jane, let's start with you. Uh, so, hang on a second. Oh, whatever. Um, the, uh, sorry, I was having a little techn technical problem there, uh, unmuting. Um, so, was it Parker Hannafin is that you, you referred to? That is one of the uh, large terrestrial manufacturers okay. of connectors, yes. So first of all, very interesting. And for sure, you know, especially the moon is not going to be anything like on Earth and, and dust is a real issue. So definitely it needs solutions. Um, but what would prevent somebody, and this, this isn't so much about you as it is with is so many new space companies I find is that a lot of new space companies, you know, they have, they, they're targeting the space market, but then there's these huge terrestrial competitors who do primarily the same thing, but haven't looked at space at all. And at some point in time, they might come in and say, ah, I can do that. I got these guys, put my little team on it and done in a, you know, space of, you know, a day or something ridiculous like that. But they just have never thought that there was a market worth addressing, so they never got to that standpoint. So it, what if they did is, I guess, my biggest concern for a company like yours is that you may have this huge competitor that comes in that you're not thinking is of, of as a competitor, be, except for terrestrial, because they have shown no interest in the area yet. Yeah, and I think what that is going to boil down to essentially is uh, experience and timeline. So, you know, they may have the resources, whether they decide to look into it now, a year from now, five years from now, um, when they see the market potential, uh, they will have some catch up to play to get from terrestrial or even aerospace qualification to space qualification, specifically related to the dusty environment. Um, and so that is what we're trying to focus on with this connector is operating in extremely harsh environments geared towards the moon, but also here on Earth, um, where traditional connectors just don't stand up. And we have tested some tradi tra uh, traditional uh, terrestrial and aerospace connectors um, that, that this regolith is so angular and so abrasive, it just demolishes them uh, and they, they can't hold a seal. And so that is what we're trying to uh, address with our connector um, and ideally beat the curve. Um, we, we hope we have an aggressive enough timeline um, that we're going to be a, ahead of companies that are going to need to, to gain uh, experience and knowledge in the lunar and, and space environments um, prior to being able to adapt and design their current uh, product line. This also plays into our strategy of involving some of the primary players rather than trying to exclude them. So setting so, up the relationships for later, because if you were going to be acquired, they would be the likely acquirer. Exactly. So establishing those partnerships and establishing, uh, turning a, a potential competition into a uh, into a uh, alliance. Which raises the um, which raises the idea of uh, a lot of the time one one type of investor that the, a lot of uh, startups ignore or don't realize as a potential is a strategic corporate investor who may want to have the technology or buy you later and they may want to make an investment in you now so that you can do this effectively for them. Perfectly sound business plan. Okay, Dave, you're up. What do you have? Yes, uh, 
it, it, it appears uh, I, I met you at the New Space Conference, I believe, in uh, 2018 in uh, uh, Kent, Washington. So, and lovely uh, to see you again. Yeah, it's been a little while. Yes, uh, it, it appears as though you've pivoted from um, uh, your your simulated. Uh, 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 moon, uh, soil, and things like that, or can you can you tell us a little bit of, about your pivot? Yeah, so uh, it, what we look at it is expanding our, our product line and services. So we still um, have been producing uh, lunar regolith simulants for going on six years now, um, mm -hmm. and we, we have a range of different materials um, and can customize those simulants as well. How that co comes into to play with this is that we've been handling simulants uh, for quite a while now and have really learned a lot of the nuances and uh, bad behavior of them when it comes to interacting with mechanical systems and, and components. We've had our own uh, equipment seize up where we can't open you know, uh, glass jars anymore because those regolith particles have gotten into uh, the, the lid. And so trying to incorporate that knowledge that we have gained into the design of our connectors was really important to us. And uh, we believe gives us a leg up on the competition. Now our background is engineering. So we look at this as also expanding back into what we originally wanted to do, which was designing hardware and technology for space. It's just, we also have the, the testing uh, pedigree um, and experience in house as well. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, you should put that in your presentation, by the way, because that experience with Regolith is something that makes you much more unique. And it's definitely something that I think other other companies would have to hire out effectively. So I think that's, yeah. you, I didn't hear you mention it. I knew your name from somewhere, but I couldn't place it. And that, uh, Dave, bringing that up, it really is, something about you that's a real strength that other people don't have. Yeah, that's been our, our objective since day one is to have a complete and deep knowledge of the issues and the environments to produce yeah. better solutions for the needs of the market. That's, yeah. that's our goal. Okay, yeah, you're, I'd, uh, I'd like uh, Amaris to come in and finish off this session. Sure, uh, thank you very much, uh, Melissa and Vince. Great presentation. So the slide that you, you put up that showed your six year history. Um, so you've, and as Eva and, and Dave were asking as well around your prior, prior areas. Um, I, I would imagine then starting in like in year four and five, it looks like you then started your connector research and started looking into connectors and won the SBAR for phase one. Uh, we didn't see any pictures of your connector in this presentation. That's the, uh, the bulk of your pitch. And so I'm wondering, is there anything you can show us? Is it, I, I'm a little confused on why we didn't see anything on what your core product is. Yeah, and that, that's due to IP concerns. We actually did have some photos in here of the exterior geometries uh, that didn't show the good stuff. Um, but unfortunately, then it's just a lot of shiny metal. Um, so that is something though, that uh, if someone would like to continue a conversation offline, uh, we can see uh, what we can do without a uh, affecting our IP. Got it, got it, okay. But you do have designs and have mock-ups and have prototypes already built that you're yes. testing now? Okay. Yeah, the, uh, that was part of the SBIR. You have to commit to providing NASA with certain physical proof of what you've developed. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we do have our prototypes and uh, we, we can't show them, but we would need to have an NDA in place in order to go into that kind of detail as well as this. Got it, okay. Um, no, that's, that's uh, definitely very critical. Would definitely like to learn more. We can chat about that. Um, yeah. How big is the market? And so how, how many missions do you envision that would be going to the lunar surface like over the next 10 years or whatever your time horizon is? And of those lunar missions, how many connectors can, can you possibly sell? Yeah, so for the purposes of, of this pitch, um, we we estimated based off kind of what's currently announced and currently planned uh, in terms of missions that as anyone in the space industry knows, uh, it's a very volatile number and can change, push forward, push back, um, have new missions added, have missions deleted. Um, and so what we're really looking at is long-term, uh, the longevity 
uh, of those missions specifically geared around ISRU developers, since there's a, a large focus on them right now. Um, and where the money is, is often where the missions go. Um, and so focusing on them, focusing on life support systems, when you have humans, you're going to need to have redundancies um, just to reduce the, the risk to human life. It is so important. Um, and if you're looking especially at long-term missions, you're going to have to essentially refuel or defuel uh, those uh, EMU suits um, in order to, to keep going with the EVAs. And so that's really kind of what we're looking at is who's currently planning to launch, who may be planning to launch, and kind of where can we insert ourselves into that picture. So right now, uh, it's, a, it's a little uh, limited in terms of of the numbers available, but we expect that once that first mission launches, there'll be a lot more defined data and groups committing to going as well. A lot of our numbers for these estimates came from uh, our i core interviews that yeah. we did. So we conducted a, a fairly extensive uh, set of i core interviews talking to end users, um, people that are actually making the decisions about what connectors they're going to need and how many. And so um, we, when we come up with numbers, we try to be um, conservative. We don't like to uh, promise too much. Got it, got it. Uh, so then do, do you view yourself then as a component supplier to some of these contractors for NASA and for large agencies and for the private operators of missions like Blue Origin? So it would be folks like Paragon or others of that, of that level, exactly. if you will? Okay. Mm -hmm. So who, who, could you name a couple of customers that you envisioned? Yeah, so specifically if we're going uh, for, for space, uh, government agencies like NASA and ESA, particularly those that are looking into an ISRU or human life support systems. Um, we also have private industry ISRU developers like Lunar Resources. You have mining and robotics uh, industry uh, organizations like Off World. Uh, folks that are going to essentially be getting down and dirty or looking for long-term solutions uh, in space. Uh, another possibility, NASA just announced a, uh, a kind of work competition for universities to demonstrate end-to-end mm -hmm. -end ISRU, and they will need connectors of this type for that. So, Okay. Uh, Very good. Uh, thank you. That's, that's all I had as far as questions. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everyone, I uh, want to say thank you once again to uh, all our great presenters today at uh, Esper Celestial Space Born and Off Planet Research uh, for some really, really great presentations. And again, thank our judges, Eva, Amoresh, and Dave for being a part of this. Now, any second now, I expect a, and here we go. Um, I guess we're getting a, from Lee's giving us a Google invite where um, where the judges and I have a special kind of digital breakout room that we're going to go to to uh, to caucus and the judges will decide who wins the grand prize of five thousand dollars so generously sponsored by Foundation for the Future. So we'll see. judges will see you there. I will be back here at three thirty to announce the winners and make a couple other announcements for future sessions as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Tom. That was great. Really enjoyed uh, seeing that. And, and yeah, I had seen uh, Melissa Roth's other company uh, in a presentation at ISU. And so it was neat to see her back as well. All right. Well, thank you very much to Tom Olson and our distinguished judges and the formidable competitors in the New Space Business Plan competition. I can't wait to hear who the, who the winner is this afternoon. Uh, next, we're going to hit, hear a bit more from Tim Chrisman for about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and Tim, that interview with John Weathersby this morning was really good. I, I really like that format. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, and he's just delightful to talk to. So that made it easy. Yeah, well, when you do a good job at something, you know what that does, right? That's what I'm told. That's what I'm it told. That one day, one day I will I aspire to be like John. <laughs> no, it means that you earn yourself more work. <laughs> oh yeah, there's that. There's that. <laughs> so I will be uh, uh, giving you more assignments to do interviews like that in the future. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, Sounds so good. I will uh, be back at about twelve twenty nine to announce our sponsor and get started with Saturday Space. Cool. Thanks, Lee.
Yep. Yeah, so I wanted to take uh, a few minutes here um, and chat about the uh, foundation's uh, workforce for the future um, pipeline that we're developing. Um, so this is uh, one of the initiatives uh, that we have running. Uh, we often talk about uh, our efforts on Capitol Hill uh, around space finance uh, and new financial tools for space. And uh, the workforce component is uh, just as active alongside that and is uh, every bit as critical because um, as we've talked about in the last couple of days, the challenge of developing the next generation of workers uh, often starts very early uh, and has a very long lead time. And so um, just unlocking money uh, to uh, pour into new space companies, new capabilities uh, is not enough. We also need the workforce to actually handle all of those new jobs. And so that's where uh, this program comes in. Uh, and yeah, excited to give you guys uh, an overview and an update of uh, where we are with it. So uh, I often talk about uh, where we're at, uh, the sort of, you are here, I'm a uh, former army. And so uh, I'm always told to orient people to where we are on the map. And so uh, depending on which uh, marketing philosophy you uh, buy into most, the important part that I'm trying to convey here is space is cool again. Space is being hyped up. There's a lot of, awesomeness being talked about around space. Um, and so I don't think we're at the peak of these expectations, nor do I think we are actually at the point where we've exhausted uh, all the early adopter enthusiasm and have truly reached that chasm that GA Moore talks about. Um, but we're close. And that in and of itself uh, gives us here at the foundation motivation to push forward uh, and push faster because we've seen, especially those of you who've been in the community a long time, seen this ebb and flow where after Apollo, after the space shuttle, uh, there has been tons of excitement, uh, a lot of hype and uh, expectation around what's next. And that often comes crashing down uh, when uh, everything meets the reality buzzsaw that is government contracting and government appropriations. And so on the workforce side, we've seen uh, over the past few decades that the space workforce development system is really geared towards creating the people NASA needs. Uh, not necessarily a problem. NASA has been the, the space organization uh, in the minds of the public and uh, in actual fact for quite a while now. Uh, and so it does tend to look like a one size fits all uh, pipeline. NASA has its space grant consortium, which administers about $100 million of grants every year for STEM education. This is a fantastic model. If you don't know much about it or don't know what uh, your state school uh, is doing with that money, um, I encourage you to just do a quick search of NASA Space Grant Consortium in your state um, because every state has a lead school. Every state is getting money through this uh, and it's doing great work. The issue is that it lacks the, the breadth of what is needed. Uh, this program doesn't train national security professionals because um, it shouldn't. And so as Space Force has been standing up, a lot of uh, work has gone into creating pipelines for uh, service members who are going to populate the Space Force and those organizations supplying uh, critical pieces of equipment. Uh, and so, um, whether it's the Air Force Academy or ROTC programs, there is a emerging workforce pipeline for them. But for the rest of the economy, the, there is nothing that can produce at scale 
the career and technical education uh, workers that are needed to actually make the satellites and rockets. Um, and I like to say it's, uh, it's for the rest of us. I'm not good at math. I'm a, I'm a policy guy who has spent 15 years uh, stealing secrets from people who don't like America. And uh, so I should not be designing a rocket or handling life support or dealing with the uh, connectors that we just heard about. Um, but there are millions of workers across the country who are doing the work of creating almost identical pieces of hardware for cars, for airplanes, for trains, uh, and for most of them, they have no idea that the space community needs them. And so that is a huge problem for us because what they don't know, they won't do. And so what we're trying to create is a kindergarten to space workforce development pathway for the rest of us. And we say kindergarten to space, not as in we're going to groom someone from kindergarten until we can throw them into space on a giant slingshot, but rather that uh, we are trying to create a pathway that has opportunities starting at the kindergarten level and progressing all the way through employment um, of uh, employment opportunities, educational certification and more. Ultimately, though, we at the foundation don't need to be creating any of this content or certifications. They exist. There's 41 schools across the country that have some variation on space uh, policy or space uh, law or other space sort of white collar uh, workforce uh, certification programs and another 21 community colleges that already have aerospace and specifically space focused technician programs that look to educate and train the pipe fitters, welders and electricians that are creating SLS, New Glenn and Starship. And what we're looking to do is build a platform where the friction between finding those opportunities and executing on them is gone. And so a one-stop shop where if there is space-related content and curriculum, we point people to it. And so that way there's no hunting for what opportunities are and where. Uh, instead, it's a single portal where all of that lives. Um, ultimately, we wanna build that out uh, to include, as I mentioned, opportunities from space camps, all the way through uh, advanced degree opportunities. And how this would work is essentially uh, building off of the work of other trade associations and nonprofits who have done this in similar um, sectors. So the advanced robotics industry has uh, the Advanced Robotics uh, for Manufacturing Institute, and they have their robotics career program that has created a nationwide network uh, where they highlight what opportunities are available uh, and then have a system to go into the schools and rec and evaluate their programs. Uh, those that meet the criteria that have been created by uh, industry, government, and academia as in terms of what is needed for going forward, get essentially a good housekeeping seal of approval uh, and uh, badge on this, this portal. Uh, we see that as a natural uh, thing to adopt for the space community, to go out and show what schools are space ready uh, and then take that to communities that are on the edge of the space economy and are looking to um, build themselves in. And now we have an established network of trainers that know how to do this. And we can then leverage state and federal grants to bring those trainers to these new communities and help the community colleges and technical schools create the programs through a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring uh, 
uh, equivalent. So um, normally this is a little bit longer of a presentation, so I'm just going to kind of blow through this pretty fast. Uh, the important thing to take away from this is over the next five years, there's quite a few different developmental gates for this program that essentially uh, starts at the uh, community and technical college level uh, and builds down. And when I say builds down, I mean we start there and then we start building into high schools and expanding the network uh, and linking up what programs exist down to middle and uh, on to elementary school. Alongside that is partnering with Space Force Association and National Security Space Association to ensure that what is being developed at the career and technical education level is useful and beneficial to the national security space. To that end, uh, we had language inserted in this year's defense appropriations bill to create a task force that will assess, evaluate, and then plan for a dedicated defense department uh, pathway uh, and mechanisms for funding said pathway for uh, this blue collar workforce. Um, we're really excited about this. This is the first time the Defense Department has ever done anything or been mandated to do anything related to blue collar uh, and skilled labor. And so uh, a pretty exciting start to this program. But uh, yeah, so essentially starting at the career technical education level, building down uh, and leveraging the work we've done with this first uh, defense appropriations bill to lay the foundation to build a nationwide system uh, with a dedicated source of federal grant money so that we can replicate the space consortium model of issuing out grants to state uh, or on a state by state basis uh, and strengthening the existing programs and allowing uh, emerging states to build up their program with the help of federal grant money. So uh, here's some financial tools or uh, projections rather. Uh, the important uh, thing to note here is that uh, for the most part, this is uh, a fairly low cost uh, system. As I mentioned, the NASA consortium is uh, utilized about 100 million in grant money not to mention uh, easily uh, equaling that in state grants. Um, and based on uh, some fairly conservative estimates, uh, we see that this roughly uh, one third to, to one quarter of that amount can uh, reach the same or uh, more students uh, than the Space Grant Consortium just because of the efficiencies you get from essentially commoditizing a lot of this training. Um, why, why do we need that? Uh, part of it is right now there is not enough workers for the space economy. We continually hear from companies that they cannot find the workers they need where they're at uh, and uh, they can't even find places to relocate to that will have the workers. And so as we're going about advocating for the Space Corporation's creation, um, we've recognized that the need for this workforce development starts now and ramps up significantly when we have success with the Space Corporation. Um, if you're not familiar with the Space Corporation uh, and what we're doing with that, Essentially, this is a infrastructure development corporation dedicated to space. Um, so it would be a public private partnership created by Congress, but requiring no new federal money. Instead, it would be authorized to issue bonds and give loan guarantees, very similar to how Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac do for the housing market but this would be on the more commercial uh, lending side. And so its mandate would be as a public benefit corporation to create those long-term 
basic building blocks of infrastructure that are needed to support a vibrant space economy. And now when I say it would be, its mandate is to create, that's a little bit of a misnomer. It's mainly to fund the creation. Space Corporation itself, it would look more like an investment fund than it would a Lockheed or Boeing. Um, and that's on purpose by keeping the overhead low and making it a essentially financial engine of growth, it's able to do more with far less money and also partner with the private sector in order to ensure that the money is going where it would be most profitable instead of relying on historical uh, appropriations and contracting processes. Just to give you a scale of what this corporation could do with its relatively small amount of money that it could raise. Um, we recently had an economic analysis done and a portfolio analysis done. We kept this as conservative as possible to avoid the sort of inside the DC Beltway hype machine. Um, but still, you can see that whether it's by bonds or uh, sale of shares, a fair bit of money can be expected in terms of its capitalization. And the actual portfolio that it can deploy, if it's done using the um, loan guarantee model, uh, it can dramatically scale up the amount of loans uh, and investments that can be made by assuming the first loss position and partnering with large institutional investors to supply the rest of the capital. Um, Based on that analysis of the portfolio, we could expect to see about $150 billion in new economic activity by the end of uh, the first decade of the Space Corporation. To put this in a sense of scale, based on what we have now, the current space economy uh, is estimated by the Department of Commerce is just south of $300 billion uh, and expected to grow anywhere from uh, 50 to 100 billion over the next 10 years. So this would essentially double, if not more, the existing estimates for growth of the space economy and adding millions of new jobs across the country uh, to the existing space workforce. The majority of these jobs being high paying, skilled uh, tradespeople jobs as opposed to the current makeup of the space economy being largely engineer and scientist heavy. Um, I'll wrap it up here. Um, the, uh, we get asked a lot, how can, how can people get involved? How can they help? Um, the first is we are a member supported nonprofit uh, and we need uh, more companies who share our vision and who are looking to make a difference in the space economy to join us as formal members. We need uh, people like you, viewers like you, to put it in the PBS parlance, uh, to help us as constituent pathfinders in your districts. Uh, you may be jaded on the state of Congress, but I can tell you, uh, and Lee will attest to this, uh, they pay attention when their constituents reach out to them. Um, we have had great success using constituent pathfinders from uh, you all and getting the attention of Congress people to take action. Uh, and then finally, uh, as Lee mentioned, uh, we're looking, we're always looking for referrals, whether it's for sponsorships of conversations for the future of the foundation itself, or uh, just uh, helping us create more programs like this new space business competition. All right, I think I have used all of my time. And so that uh, probably forecloses the ability to do questions. My apologies, Lee. Thank you so much, Tim. That was great. I always uh, enjoy hearing you talk about that sort of thing. Welcome to Saturday Space, the feature where we talk about things we might enjoy on Saturday in space, arts, sport, recreation, and entertainment. Today's Saturday Space is sponsored by the Thunderbird School of Management's Executive Master of Global Management in Space Leadership, Business, and Policy. Thank you for your generous sponsorship. 
Our special guest today is Damien Kulash Jr. He's an artist, musician, filmmaker, and the frontman for the polymath rock group OK Go. He's directed the band's long string of boundary-pushing music videos, racking up more than 300 million views online. They've danced in zero gravity and on treadmills. They've built a warehouse-sized Rube Goldberg machine to run in sync with a song, and they've choreographed hundreds of explosions filmed in just a few seconds. And don't forget the umbrella scooters. Damien has received the Smithsonian American Ingenuity Award for Visual Art, a Grammy, three MTV VMAs, 21 Can Lions, three Webby Awards, and has had his work presented at the Guggenheim, MoCA, LACMA, the Hirshhorn, the Hammer Museum, and Seattle's Museum of Pop Culture. He graduated magna cum laude from Brown University in 1998, and he's written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and Rolling Stone. He's also testified before US Congress in support of net neutrality. He serenaded Barack Obama at his 50th birthday party, appeared on The Simpsons, and Animal from The Muppets, whom we all know and love, once played the drums in his garage. Damien lives and works in Los Angeles, and thank you so much, Damien, for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to talk with us today. Thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. All right, well, we invited you here because you made a spectacular music video in simulated microgravity on a parabolic plane. We put a link in the chat for our audience a few comments ago, uh, and this venue has had an ongoing conversation about art, sport, recreation, and entertainment in space, and your video puts some of the things we've talked about into action. For this particular song, you could have chosen a freight train video. <laughs> or, or focused on that lyric, gravity is just a habit. Did you know when you wrote those lyrics uh, what your plans were for this video, or did that idea come later? Uh, that idea definitely came later. We, um, as soon as I learned about parabolic flight, I'm guessing early aughts, um, I was like, that is something we have to do for video. But uh, the economics of making music videos in in microgravity aren't such that you can just plan on that happening. You know, you can't you can't be like, yeah, I'll write a song about that. Um, yeah. We had to. Uh, I pitched that idea to. I can't tell you how many sponsors. Every time some a brand would come to us and say, "We love your videos. Do you want to make a video uh, for our brand?" And say, "Yeah, yeah. You know, Pepsi." really won't look like the real thing you want until you see it in zero gravity. And they go, yeah, I don't think so. Um, but one, uh, like just by sheer luck after I think uh, seven years of those pitches or something, um, a an airline came to us and said, uh, we'd love to collaborate with you. What, how do you work? And I said, well, our best, the best version of a collaboration for us is for you to tell us that what you have that you'd like us to make art with and then give us a moment to do it. Yeah. And they were like, well, just what would you do with an airplane? And I was like, I know exactly what I do in a, with an airplane. <laughs> um, and, uh, and they were, they had the, the uh, good humor and flexibility and sort of creative uh, um, bravery to, to try to pull something like that off. It's not, you know, it's very different than what marketing budgets are normally spent on. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's the type of thing that you can't, I didn't know what it was going to look like going into it. It's just sort of like, we, you have to, you have to really extend a lot of, uh, faith in the process and just sort of go like, we're going to do, we're going to do something. And I, it, I think it would have been very hard to do with, uh, it, that we did that with a Russian airline called S7, and I think it would have been very, very hard to do with a big American airline, uh, where there's a much uh, more sort of careful uh, machinery for their marketing. You know, um, yeah. and it was it was an amazing experience. Like the what what they said, how, okay, if, if we were to do this idea, what would you do? And and I was like, well, our process is basically. It, there's sort of three main steps. One is is building a cat, building a, a vocabulary of things we think are really awesome within whatever sandbox we've chosen, um, and and this sandbox is of course an incredibly exciting one, but one that's also very hard to guess about in advance. Um, yeah. You don't know what's going to look good. You don't you certainly don't know how it's going to feel and how things are going to act, but. Um, 
our assumptions about what will have emotional impact in that space are, are very hard to check. Um, you, you know, we can all guess pretty accurately about how physics is going to work and how and, and what sorts of things we can plan on happening from a scientific perspective, but from an emotional perspective, it's very hard to guess. Um, so it was like, we'll need to spend a bunch of time just trying stuff. Once we have uh, that big sort of set of cool tricks, we have to figure out the sentence we are saying with that vocabulary we now have. Um, and uh, that, you know, choreograph and practice. And then finally we have to shoot the thing. Um, and they said, well, how many, how many parabolic flights would you need? And we're like, uh, 20. And, um, and, and so, uh, and so it was, we, we wound up, be, it, we wound up having to do 21 so we could get one last take. Um, uh, and, it, and we went for, we, we used, we flew from the Ross Cosmos base um, uh, about an hour and a half east of, of Moscow. And, um, and it was a spectacularly strange and wonderful experience. Well, you brought up Sandbox uh, as a place where you play and design ideas for, for your creative arts. Talk about the educational platform. You know, this conference is on workforce development for space uh, and industrial base. Talk about the Sandbox platform, how you came up with that idea and why you decided to use your videos educationally. Uh, I should say that I, I I feel like teachers came up with a, this idea. What what um, the the thing we're discussing here is is uh, okgosandbox.org, which is our um, our sort of our educational side project. We call it. It's um, it, it is a collaboration between the band and the the Playful Learning Lab at uh, the University of Saint Thomas, which is confusingly in Saint Paul. Um, and uh, the the Playful Learning Lab is this amazing group of of students. And Dr. Anne Marie Thomas, their leader, um, who uh, study playful learning, um, as their name implies. And uh, she and I met at a conference, uh, and I, 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 I told her that we had been hearing from teachers for decades now that they use our videos in their classrooms, and it's always, uh, it's always such a a big honor. Um, and it's a little bit, it's, it's almost a little embarrassing in the sense that we are, you know, um, as you might expect of, of artists or rock musicians, a little bit, uh, you know, short-sighted and, and self-centered. Like, we just want to make, we're like, we want to make these cool things. And the best we can hope for um, with a piece of music or a video we thought was that it would go out in the world, maybe make somebody feel a little bit of human connection, maybe make somebody's day less lonely, make, maybe help somebody get at that thing in their soul that they were trying to, that, that it's scratched deep in your brain that you're always trying to itch and qu can't quite get to. But you definitely don't think your videos are gonna come back to you going like, hey, I've been out in the world teaching basic physics to a bunch of underprivileged kids. Like it's uh, the, the, the things, the, the selfless and amazing things that teachers do were, uh, are so much more noble than what we do that to learn that our videos are being used for engineering classes and uh, physics classes and um, systems thinking and um, ev and just you know in music classes and art classes um, has always been very uh, thrilling. But we also didn't really know how to support it. Like, what do you do other than we can't make? You know, our videos can be very expensive and very time consuming to make. How do you? How do we make them any faster? Um, we can't. But so I asked her, like, what do we do to help teachers? And she was like, well, you just ask teachers what they want. So we did. Um, and we she helped us put out a survey for for educators. And um, we got an incredible response uh, about what tools teachers would like from the band. And so we, we with her help, uh, we've been making them. And um, we call it OK Go Sandbox because that is the metaphor we most often use. It's it's um, it. Uh, uh, I could I could talk about it specific to space, or I could talk about it specific to to um, ones and zeros, or I could talk about it specific mm -hmm. to music. It's um, I think our uh, what we most often are trying to do is is figure out the the right balance between respecting categories and and blowing right through them. 
Um, and, and so defining what our sandbox is at any given time, whether that's uh, the sounds we're gonna use for the guitar solo, or that is what type of idea this video is going to have, or um, whether or not uh, aerospace should be considered a scientific endeavor or a, a, an artistic one. Um, there, it's all sort of the same. It's all the, the, the same balance all the time. You need categories to, to parse something, but you also need to uh, have a healthy disrespect for those categories. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. We're, we're excited to see more from, from Sandbox. Can you take a snippet from that? You have a great video on how you made this uh, production, the so logistics of the parabolic timing and, and all. Can you just do a brief little snippet to give us an example of what's on Sandbox? As you can see, brief is not my strong suit, but I will, um, I will, I will do my best. Um, the uh, as uh, uh, usually when I'm asked questions about this video, I have to explain what parabolic flight is, and luckily this is one one group I assume I don't need to do that with. Um, on top of it. <laughs> what, the, yeah. So this, um, uh, as you know, the 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 maximum safe uh, microgravity period uh, f that most people use is is roughly 29 seconds, somewhere between 25 and 30 seconds. Um, if you're going between I guess 15,000 and 40,000 feet. Um, and our song, uh, our song could be broken down into eight segments that were uh, that were the same length and roughly and fit in with the, within that period. Um, or I should say, our song could be broken down into. Uh, eight 21 second periods. Um, and what, and so, and that wound up helping us very slightly because things in, a, a, after that long discovery period, see, I'm already not being brief. Um, after that long discovery period, we realized that one problem with emotions in zero gravity is that everything looks like it's in slow motion a little bit because it's basically the same. Um, the signifiers our brain uses for saying, oh, this is slow motion, like something isn't falling at the rate you'd expect um, are all happening in front of you in zero gravity. So um, getting things to look sharp and dancey and exciting and somehow having a, a kind of wow factor, um, it helps to speed things up a little bit. It also, we needed the, to cut the music up in a, um, uh, in a, in a way where, the, uh, let's start again. We knew that our eventual video, we wanted to, uh, uh, to be floating the whole time, but we couldn't do that for three plus minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so we also wanted it to be a single take uh, so that you weren't doing it, so that it wasn't sort of a greatest hits of what we were doing up there, but you actually knew this was a real event. And that's often the trick we use in our videos is just make sure there's as little filmmaking as, as possible, that it, it really is just sort of the most transparent window you can use into seeing this real event. So we had to do a series of parabolas in a row and somehow deal with all the time that the plane would be catching us in double gravity, reclimbing and throwing us in double gravity. For each of those, each period is about five minutes of recovery time uh, and about 30 seconds of weightless time. So, or of microgravity time. And, um, and so what we did was we strung those together and sped up those five minutes so fast that their effect, it's almost like an edit. It's basically, we like, we, we stayed perfectly still in our chairs for five minutes uh, and then restarted. The, the effect of that in the video is that you see us floating, 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 and then every once in a while we have to land for a second and pop back up. We're actually landing, waiting there for five minutes and then popping back up. Um, but we wanted those landings to be on musical beats. So instead of just cutting it up every 28 seconds, we figured out where they, the, where the, um, the segments of four or eight that we could land on so that it would feel musical. Once we had that, we now knew that this, these are, we'll have eight segments of choreography. We had to learn them independent of each other, then string them together. And then basically by trial and error, figure out how you start the music and the dance just in time to achieve the maximum amount of weightlessness, but also not, um, you, we couldn't end too early or too late because if, if gravity appears right in the, appears right in the middle of the song, you're, we'll be plopping out of, of the video. If, if we can't get down to our seats in time for the, for the sort of jump in time, um, we also will be popping out of the video. So it was a lot of, a lot of delicate math and trial and error. 
that was not brief and probably very confusing. <laughs> I thought it was fascinating. And anyone who uh, we have some questions in the chat about the the uh, name, the Vomit Comet, and how you all fared, but they can go watch the video. Uh, you cover that in uh, the sandbox. We were all on scopolamine. Um, sorry, <laughs> all the Americans were on scopolamine. Uh, no, not all. All of the band members were on scopolamine. Scopolamine, scopolamine, as it turns out, is illegal in Russia, um, or at least uh, is a tightly controlled substance and not something that that um, we were allowed to bring for our uh, compatriots. And so our our Russian friends um, were on other anti nausea drugs, and some of them did not work as well as ours. Too bad. Let's just leave it at that. Darn you get to is. know what a liquid <laughs> looks like floating past when the, when the, the you know, the, the hardest thing to do, of course, in that circumstances is, is focus on a tiny little thing. Uh, um, you know, the best thing to do is just look out the window. It, but our playback guy had a little MP3 player. And as you know, from the last answer, if he didn't hit it exactly the right time on an exactly the right song, you know, the right segment of the, of the song, everything would go, um, up the creek and the poor guy was just standing there like this the whole time and just i it, he puked twice per flight that poor guy because he was it, but what a what a hero so a quick question from a dancer's perspective did you audition the dancers in the plane or make selections on the ground and were they experienced already in parabolic flight they we had to guess at what type of dancers would make sense um for for this and uh, we could not waste a flight auditioning people. So um, we were trying to think about what, it, like, who would have the right skills for something. The dancer act, uh, traditional dancers are, rely so much on gravity that they were sort of perfectly wrong for this. Um, and uh, synchronized swimmers uh, rely so much on, on being able to push off the water around them that they would be wrong for this. And the best we could come up with was, um, aerialist acrobats mm -hmm. those are both uh, circus performers who do a lot of spinning um on it you know the the people who do uh silks or spinning in a big hoop um our 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 thinking was they'll have great body control and they will be less likely to get motion sick um it, that that uh well, let's see we were we were figuring that what they most needed to be able to do was control their body um, using internal forces rather than external ones. Um, the, the thing that I knew from having done test flights prior to this um, was, was everybody's first instinct is to dog battle. You know, everybody wants to push yeah. off, of, you know, and everybody thinks that you have some control over your body because we're all used to having either a surface to push off of, or if you feel weightless, presumably it's because you're floating in water. And so you, you do the thing you learn from that. Um, and, uh we made a good we made a good choice i think in the end um the, the those women were vastly more talented in that space than we were and could do and could control themselves much more than we could that actually they were spectacular and they settled a bit of a debate here but you may be able to bring it back to life um we we talk in this crowd about how people can do things in weightlessness that they can't do on earth and that's brought about a debate as to whether that means it's a level playing field. Does it, does it level the playing field or is it just a new playing field? And I think looking at the difference between your movements and the dancers' movements supports the argument that it's just a new playing field and people are gonna develop their advantages and disadvantages. But what thoughts do you have about that? It's absolutely just a different playing field. There's nothing <laughs> level about it. It's, it is the farthest <laughs> thing from level. Um, it is... Uh, There are so many ways to cut that. One is the the different if, if, types of physicality that are useful, um, but also the if, at least for our generation and presumably several to come, um, it is the the novelty of that experience is going to come infrequently and and later in life. So it's not going to be something you learned uh, it, when your body was learning. I mean, I have, I have three-year-old um, twins right now. Uh, in fact, I almost was late to this because we were having a meltdown upstairs about um, how I didn't let one of them watch me make coffee. Um, 
but there I watched them all day long doing uh, their bodies immediately learned um, uh, physical equilibrium things that our bodies would take months or years now of training to do and they're just they're incredible machines for learning. Our bodies will never have, we won't ever have the chance to do that with zero gravity. So the, the, a, 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 sorry, our generation won't, who knows about future generations, but um, uh, it means that there was a, a stark difference I could, I saw among the adults, uh, uh, which is all of us, um, uh, in learning curve and, and, and how people uh, approach that sort of steep cliff. Um, I, re I really enjoyed that experience and really had fun sort of with the disorientation of it. Um, at least one member of our band really hated it. Um, and, by, and, and by the 21st flight, finally got the courage to try some things that he then found really fun. Um, but it is just, you know, some of that is it personality type, some of that is personal history, some of that is physicality, but there's, uh, it, it, I could even get more into, I mean, it'd be boring here, but that it's it's not a linear curve for everybody either. There's people who will try things right away. It's like, there's so much to learn and so many ways to learn it that um, that it is, again, the farthest thing from a level playing field, but it's many, many new playing fields that cut different ways, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you talked a little bit about the timeline to doing more uh, where do you see the future of arts in space? And would you expand your body of work as space tour de tourism develops if those opportunities were to arise? Uh, the, the second one's easier to answer. Yes, we would. Um, uh, but our our criteria is different than, for, for what makes a good project is different than people often assume um, because they so often are uh, land on people as sort of... Uh, novelty or as like using a novel idea, um, th th those are equated in their minds. And to us, uh, it's very, it's often very hard to find a good idea with something that's purely novel. Um, like what would, what would we shoot in, if, if I could go up for eight minutes with, with, uh, with one of the billionaires who's doing that these days, um, what would I shoot? It would, I, I, it, it it would, I couldn't think of anything better than what we've already made. And in fact, it would be much worse because I could only go up once instead of 20 times. Over, you know, so uh, if there's, it, in terms of, um, it, well, I, that'll actually lead me to the other answer. We, if the, where, where do I think uh, art in space is going? I, I would like to invert that sort of uh, back to the sort of category question before. I think it's important to have these categories. I'm, I think it's very important that people study physics and um, engineering and, and various uh, specificities within specific concerns within the aerospace industries, uh, we would never have gotten here without it. But it's also important to look, um, I, I will use it, uh, a personal experience. I remember going to the, uh, um, the vehicle assembly building in uh, where, where they were in the process of dismantling the final, uh, the last, uh, space shuttle, I guess not fully dismantling it, but restoring it um, about 10 years ago, whenever that was, and, uh, and, and feeling a sense of awe in that building that was more, I, more like a cathedral than any cathedral I've ever been in. Um, I went to school in the shadow of a cathedral at a, at a boys' school in Washington, D.C., and I spent a lot of time in that cathedral, and it was amazing. Uh, but the, the, the essence of those spaces was very similar because they're basically the same project. Like a person in 1950 saying we need to start going to space is just as crazy as somebody saying we should build this massive, you know, uh, house of God in, in a few centuries prior, like that doing something so, so purely, um, based on curiosity and wonder starts to that's like where where these categories merge at the very top it's sort of like we just care it's just it's just too fascinating and too wonderful and too weird and you have to start breaking that down very you know below that is this a scientific concern or a mathematical concern or a theological concern but you're they're all at the end it all is really the same impulse that we're dealing with and um there is nothing about space that is um, 
more scientific than than um, life on Earth. You know, there's nothing about art that needs to stay in this atmosphere. It's like there. Uh, those are just convenient categories we use. And so as, as, the, the, as access to space becomes something that doesn't need to be so tightly controlled because it's so expensive and because um, uh, utilitarian concerns and scientific concerns are trumping all other concerns, um, there will be more and more opportunity for those categories to start to destabilize a little bit, I think. And um, I, I'm trying to think if there's a if there are good corollaries. Uh, what like there are, you can think of of really anything that was that that is that we think of as art was one time long 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 before that purely practical and pragmatic. You know, um, even paint. You know, even language. It's like there's uh, once once we get past the, the pure necessity of something is how do we get out into space how do we get how do we survive on the surface of mars or, or how do we how do we how do our bodies react to to long periods of weightlessness um once we've dealt with those pure necessities our immediate instinct will be like how do we connect with one another how do we uh how do we make this more powerful than the single experience that I'm having? How do we communicate this to the rest of the world? And uh, I mean, the, the things you will, we will all think about on our deathbed will not be equations, presumably they will be human experiences and that most of our lives are spent, are, are spent trying to deal with those human experiences with the people we love or the people we're scared of or the people we, you know, it's like, that's our whole life. So that will be all of space eventually too. It just, we're just in the phase where we are, are barely chipping away at it and um, sooner than I think we can imagine that the more human concerns of, of the humanities will be all over space too. That's wonderful. Your, your comparison of cathedrals to space related things uh, is a comparison drawn by uh, the author Frank White and space scholar Frank White in his book, The Overview Effect. Uh, in more ways than just the feeling that it gives you, um, although that as well. So you might enjoy reading that book. Um, you've advocated for net neutrality before Congress, and it it sounds like you're uh, kind of into space, which I wasn't sure when I, <laughs> when I set this up. Do you see yourself as a possible advocate for making space one of the critical infrastructures for the United States, especially as satellite constellations are bringing the internet to underserved communities? Absolutely. Unquestionably. Wonderful. Okay, well, we'll spread the word on that. Yeah. Um, so everyone knows your wonderful videos. Tell us about, just for fun, a failure that you've had. Oh boy. Uh, something that just didn't work. I, um, they aren't as, as, as binary as that. It's not work or don't work. It's, it's, um, it, it is, uh, the things that ha haven't worked yet are many, you know, um, there are, uh, If I could do 20 more of those flights and knew it, this would be a totally different video. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, so it's, so this, this video, which did work, failed to do some things that it would have done if I had, if I had 40 flights in, instead of 20. Um, and, and there are many, like I, there are a handful of ideas I'm really excited about artistically right now all of which are more expensive than I can personally afford. And so all of them have failed so far. Um, and <laughs> the way I'm imagining them in my mind is not how they will wind up coming out if they, if I ever find the funding for them. Um, and, uh, and then look, so, so that's sort of like, um, how how it's not digital you know how it's not binary from one from one angle from the other angle it's it's looking back on things that have happened and whether or not there there were failures um it, it's more like you learn from things what you expected to happen and didn't and there is there is a video we made um where uh where it's an animation and each frame of that animation is um 
is toasted into a piece of bread. So we used a laser cutter to very lightly toast things in very specific patterns. And um, there's 3000 something um, slices of, of bread, all of which were past the sell by date and were donated by the company. I, I did not realize how many people would be very upset that we had raised, wasted all of And, and fed to wild plus. ducks, right? After that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, you, they're, they're even more shocking. There's several of them are still in my basement and not moldy at all, um, which makes me think of how I'm not gonna tell you what brand it is because that's how much preservative is in it and we would like to be nice to them. Um, Anyhow, uh, the issue, uh, I, my, I learned a lot from that video because I thought, um, I thought that this new, that, that doing something in this very physical way uh, where you could feel the sense of animation and you could sort of like, you never lost touch with the fact that these were real objects um, would, would have a, I, I expected it to feel one way that it didn't. Um, it it yeah. does feel that way, but only for the first 15 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, maybe. Um, I, it, you quickly lose, uh, for me at least, for most people I've sort of like watched, watch it, quickly are watching the animation. Just It's just a, a story and that's beautiful, that's wonderful, but it's also means that that video after the first 30 seconds never sort of has a new sense of wow a new, it, it, uh, our, uh, our projects are often a, um, a, about trying to choreograph surprise more than they are anything else. To so sort of like build a, build a crescendo of, of, of wonder or of, of curiosity that matches.